Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name is A. Flanna Moore. I go by AP. Uh, I am pleased to introduce myself as the Assistant Director for Alumni Engagement uh, with Affinity Groups, and that is Professional Special Interests and in Cultural Alumni Constituencies for the University of Oregon and their Alumni Association. Um, in my role, I work primarily to raise awareness of all the Affinity Group programs to grow their membership, uh, to assist with development and fundraising opportunities, but also to promote exciting activities and events that both the Affinity Group puts on as well as our partners outside of the university like this one. So I'm so excited that you all have joined us tonight um, in recognition of National BIPOC, which is Black, Indigenous, and People of Color Mental Health Month. A little historical background uh, on this month. In June of 2008, B.B. Uh, Moore Campbell who was a American author, journalist, teacher, and mental health advocate who worked tirelessly to shed light on mental health needs within the black community and, under, and other underrepresented communities. Uh, as a result of her hard work, July is now recognized as National BIPOC Mental Health Month. And so in an effort to continue this necessary work tonight, uh, we will tackle the taboo as we will discuss black male mental health within our community. However, before we engage in an overdue uh, yet provocative conversation among some black male thought leaders, I'm sorry, black male thought leaders, uh, I would like to introduce Eugene City Council member and also the Associate Vice President of Equity and Inclusion at Lane Community College, Mr. Greg Evans, for a very special welcome. Can you please show the video? Greetings. My name is Greg Evans, and I'm the Associate Vice President for Equity and Inclusion at Lane Community College. And welcome to this particular webinar on black men and mental health. This is a critical and important issue. We as black men don't often recognize that we have a problem and that we need help. This webinar is designed to provide resources and tools for you to be able to address any kind of mental health crisis or chronic condition that you or a loved one may suffer from. Please sit back and take notes because there will be critical information that I'm sure you can use. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Evans. Uh, so I would like to, we're gonna get into a very quick, short documentary. Uh, it's very impactful. However, as we spoke about earlier, if you watch the montage, uh, trigger warnings are necessary. Um, this short documentary's objective is to raise awareness of depression within black and African-American males and the detriment of not addressing it, as well the benefits of treatment. So we hope that by exposing the illness in this artistic fashion, that the African-American community will not only be enlightened, but they will learn to recognize and seek help for themselves or for loved ones. Can you please show the video? Did you ever have thoughts of hurting yourself? Disney star Lee Thompson Young was found dead, but Young's manager said the actor, quote, tragically took his own life. Soul Train legend Don Cornelius has died. He died from what investigators are saying at this time was an apparent suicide. Violator Entertainment founder Chris Lighty has died at the premature age of 43. Sources are saying his death was a suicide via a gunshot wound to the head. Depression is an illness that affects more than 14 million Americans. But black Americans seek help for depression far less often than whites do. For black men, sometimes it's the stigma of mental illness that prevents them from being open about their struggle with depression. 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 I mean, it, we're saying that black men are five times more likely 
than black women are to commit suicide. So, I mean, there's a real problem going on and Good. still we're not, we're not addressing it. There's a real need for the conversation to begin. I mean, black men increasingly over time have actually been more successful at committing suicide than women. Women tend to attempt suicide using more passive measures. Men tend to actually commit suicide using more aggressive measures. So in an instance where a man is contemplating suicide, five to one, he's going to actually commit suicide. Suck it up and be a man. I feel bad. I didn't mean to yell at him. My moods are so unpredictable. I feel sad. So when was the first time you knew you knew that you were depressed? Iman had to fend for Iman. Mm -hmm. So I began to stay in my room cry myself sometimes and just, I felt alone all the time basically. Even though I did have my mom and the sisters that loved me, I knew I had to shield that type of pain from them. So what made you think that you should take your own life as opposed to something else? I just had it. I just really had it. I was, I was tired of fighting. I was tired of going through because this wasn't the first time that love knocked me down or anybody else said something. I was always bullied. I was always, my life was just hard. I was tired of it. So I was like, you know what? Why not just go, 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 go. So we expect our black boys and black men to be angry, but we don't expect them to be sad or depressed or even to have days where they just typically feel blue. And I think if we get to a point where we can understand that these are human emotions, they're not gender specific, then we can allow not only our black girls, but our black boys to be able to express how deeply they're hurt and how deeply they are in pain. We have to actually experience these things. We have to talk about these things because our boys are also dying from this. Everything feels so pointless. I feel so lost and anxious. Things are going well. Why do I feel like this? Why do I have sex so much? What's the point of life? What's wrong with me? I can't sleep. I can't eat. I feel sad. I feel like I'm losing my mind. I can't do this anymore. I'm not crazy. I am not crazy. I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. I am not crazy. I am not crazy. I'm not crazy. And I remember Chris Rock telling me once that four of his friends who were comics committed suicide, shot themselves in the head, you mm -hmm. know? So it's the funniest person that you know who could be the one who's suffering the, you know, suffering the most. Yeah. So we have to be aware that when we talk about depression, it's not just about having sleep issues, appetite issues, being sad all the time. Depression can manifest itself in so many different ways, including rage, including the slow suicide that we've talked about as far as uh, very destructive behaviors. I guess the hard part was not knowing. I mean, uh, I guess I'll always feel like maybe I could have done something. But I didn't have a clue. Okay. Um, if that didn't at least get something going inside of you, I'm sure that our panelists and the conversation today will. Um, and so for that, um, I do want to go ahead and take this time to introduce our moderator for the night. Uh, he's the man who was behind this event. Uh, he's the current Black African-American student program coordinator and faculty member, as well as being the founder of GRIOT, Greatness Rediscovered in Our Time Mentoring Organization. Uh, without further ado, uh, that is Dr. Lawrence A. Rashid, um, and he will be the moderator for tonight, uh, along with the other esteemed panel. I do want to remind the panelists uh, that for our 
answers, please try to limit yourself to about a five minute answer. Uh, so with that, Dr. Rashid, will you please take it away? Sure, thank you AP, doing an outstanding job being our MC. Um, man, this is just an outstanding event. Um, humbled to be the moderator. Um, before we get into the discussion, um, I think I'll be remiss. Um, one of our students at Lane uh, Community College was unfortunately involved in an incident that occurred, I believe, yesterday at Springfield. So we wish the best for that um, young man, one of our BSU students. So we wish him well, and I'm pretty sure investigations are taking place, but we wish him and his family well during his time. Um, again, I mean, this, these are things we deal with as black males. Um, and again, I don't want to just you know, go over that like it's just not important, but um, I, I do want to get to the heart of it. And I think this speaks to what we're here for today. So with that being said, thank you, gentlemen. Um, please, um, again, I, I just, I'm just overwhelmed. So let's get into it. Um, what I would like to do first is to have you do two things. Um, I would like to have you do a self-introduction because I think you could do it better than I can. Um, and I also would like you to, if you would, reflect on what you saw in that short, um, if you want to. Um, again, feel free to not do it if it triggers some type of emotions. But um, again, I would like for you to share um, you know, your experience or background with you currently, and also a, a quick reflection on the video as it pertains to um, African American Black Mental um, Health Concern. Black male mental health concern. And we'll start off with um, Mr. Um, Cornelius Johnson. You got to unmute yourself, brother. Can you hear me now? Hello? You hear me? Okay. Yes, Kyle, go ahead. Oh, uh, Cornelius Johnson. Um, I'm retired captain of police from the San Francisco Police Department, uh, served 30 years, uh, almost every capacity from patrol, special investigations, traffic enforcement, uh, special operations. So I really, uh, but my main focus was trying to change the methodology and how we police, especially in the black community. I did research in community policing, and looking for best practices and how we can achieve that goal. Um, the institution itself is a perilous one for black men. One, it's very difficult to get into. And two, it's very difficult to achieve those positions of power and authority in order to influence policy. Um, my road to the top was a difficult one. And I'm going to try to incorporate that because I think it's a, it's a microcosm of society overall. We are in institutions that we are beholden to uh, for our livelihood, and sometimes speaking our blackness can result in adverse consequences. So that's where I'm coming from tonight. Thank you. I enjoyed being on the panel tonight. And Dr. Rashid, thank you for inviting me. Secondly, my reflection on what I saw earlier is real. I think one of the things that we have as black men is machismo. How do we maintain, we associate our blackness to being tough, being able to handle it, be able to hold it down, uh, and any signs of weakness such as crying or any display of emotions can be um, a bad taboo, if you will. Pressures from the outside or peer groups. And so the, the montage really reflect on what we all have to struggle with. How do we now become a supporting cast? How do we now begin to identify young brothers, men in general, for instance, of all ages, and seek to give them the support necessary to get through hard times? Uh, hard times is nothing new. We all go through it. It's how we respond is the question. So that's, that's what I reflected on. Um, and having a son of age, uh, at that age now, um, I'm doing more work to keep him, his mental health, uh, sturdy than I was just working in the police department. So uh, it hits home and it's real. And so uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Khan. Um, let me go to Dr. T. Hassan. Same, same question. Okay. 
I'm hoping we don't all end up dealing with this unmute thing all night because I've made that mistake too many times. Uh, yes, Dr. T. Hassan Johnson. Um, I particularly, uh, I'm Africana Studies at Fresno State, um, but I was, I, was, I was impressed by the video and I appreciated it. Uh, and it definitely stirred some things because um, as a matter of fact, um, Mr. Lee Thompson Young um, actually reached out to me um, he was doing, a, he was kind of studying different spiritualities or he was looking into one and he had called me about the uh, school of thought I'm engaged in. And I just referred him to some other people. And I, I don't know if he ever managed to reach them. But one of the things that, that hurt me after I found out he passed because I went to school with his mother was that, um, I didn't take the opportunity to actually engage them. I just thought, let me send him to somebody who can probably answer his questions, but you never know when one word may be helpful, you know, one word may be something that could have really, you know, you never really know. And so, you know, one of the things that hurt me when he passes, I didn't take the opportunity to actually engage him and, and, you know, you never know what could have happened. So that said, um, uh, that was a very powerful piece. As far as, as the overall issue in regard to black males and mental health, one of the things I, I, I put forward is that there's also a pressure that we grapple with uh, in regard to social expectation because the particular history we have in this country, the perception of us, both by, you know, white society, by mainstream culture, <clears throat> but even in some respects, uh, you know, internal to the, the black community itself, there is this prevailing idea that black men, black masculinity and, and, and hyper masculinity are synonymous. You know, we are these kind of, you know, John Henry figures that, that have to be able to endure whatever, um, at the expense of our own humanity, as a matter of fact, and if we can't, uh, that we feel will be thrown away. And in some respects, we've seen that happen with various people. And when some have reached out, uh, grappling with different types of issues, you know, they've often been laughed at and ridiculed and so on and so forth. So um, I appreciate this panel and I appreciate this discussion because it, it, I hope it lends itself to normalizing Black men reaching out for support. And, and readily receiving it, but not being mocked when they when they extend that hand for it. So I'll just leave it there for the time being, and we'll engage a little more later. Absolutely, thank you, um, Dr. Tiasan Johnson. Mm -hmm. And let me go to um, Professor Harris. And we could just all leave our our our. Um, we could leave it off mute, so we could just easily get to it. Halito Gamshilakwan. Halito is uh, greetings from the Choctaw Nation. Damshi Lakawan is from the Kalapuya Nation, which Lane Community College is on, and Hotep, which is peace in ancient Comedian, which you know as Egypt. I'm making that reference because I believe that the sources of Black mental health have to go back to before we were brought here as slaves to when we first came here because we were pyramid builders and we were trading with the pyramid builders here on Turtle Island. So to define ourselves as Du Bois talks about by a tape that is too short, that doesn't encompass our soul is problematic. Um, so I'm an addictions therapist, a mental health therapist coming out of um, a black psychology framework which recognized that racism exists. It can be taxonomized. It has many, many manifestations and history is part of the healing, but also activism is part of the healing and making your life matter. So I'm really glad to be part of this historical event. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Harris. Um, let me get to my brother from another mother. Please don't make me laugh. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Lamont Francis. Good evening um, out there. First of all, um, I want to thank the God of heaven for allowing us to have this opportunity. And it's good to be in this, um, this, this chat room uh, with so many distinguished uh, panelists. And so I, I I greet you and I, and I thank God for your presence. I want to thank uh, Dr. Lawrence A. Rashid. The A stands for all good. Amen. And we are so thankful that he has put this thing together. First, I just want to uh, just briefly introduce myself. 
Uh, I'm Dr. Lamont Francis. I've uh, been a senior minister uh, for 17 years uh, now. This is my 17th year. I started young. Um, I've been an educator um, in the uh, public schools and mostly urban schools for now 20 uh, years, serving as a counselor, a teacher at all three levels, and also an administrator. Um, I'm also an adjunct professor of sociology, um, uh, and I've been doing that for the last 10 years. Um, I want to go ahead and just uh, briefly say that the, um, the, the, the video was uh, powerful um, uh, because it, it, it brought out a lot of uh, raw emotions. Um, I think um, uh, just echoing what I've heard uh, said earlier, um, it addresses, I think the, the, the root of the problem is racism when you talk about black men, mental health issues, right? Uh, racism is prejudice plus power. Racism is the original global pandemic uh, that we've been suffering uh, with and from. Um, and as a result, we tend to uh, react to the results of racism without really understanding the underlying root of it. And so tonight, uh, what we hope to do is um, look at the roots of racism and look how it affects us and how it affects us as Black men in regards to uh, mental health. And so I, I look forward to that discussion tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Francis. Um, and let me go to uh, another one of my brothers um, from the Pacific, great Pacific Northwest, um, Mr. Damian Pitts. Uh, first of all, I was like, who are you talking about? I am not from the Pacific Northwest. I am from Memphis. True and true, but I currently live in Oregon. Uh, hey, y'all, my name is Damien Pitts. I'm an academic advisor and diversity initiative specialist and in Lockwood's College of Business at the University of Oregon, at the University of Oregon, excuse me. Uh, I, uh, like I said, I grew up in Memphis, uh, predominantly black city, and so a lot of things that these brothers are saying really hit home. Just think about how I was raised and all that stuff. Uh, but instead of going right into college, uh, I went into the army for 10 years and you know this was late 90s where things were starting to change in the military because of like sexual harassment stuff uh, and don't ask don't tell and it was changing for the better but one thing that we were never taught was self-care because the mission was always more important and honestly I still believe that I think the team is one of the greatest concepts and I'm willing to sacrifice myself for a team that I feel supports me and so self-care isn't something that I do well I'm getting better at it but also you know I, I'm not human so what stresses other people out doesn't stress me out but I'm starting to realize that I'm not as superhuman as I think I am uh mentally and physically um yeah, and so that's me. Um, I'm a sociologist by trade. I study the African diaspora and terrorism, mostly in grad school. Uh, right now, <clears throat> one of my, even though I'm not in school, I mean, one of the things that I focus on is uh, uh, elitism and classism within social movements uh, and how social movements have been very divisive and somewhat problematic, but we as Black people have a tendency to ignore certain things about it. Uh, and so that's kind of some of the things that I focus on now. I'm very active with the scouting program, which I'm an Eagle Scout. So that was one thing that was a huge part of my life growing up. Uh, and it really helped me kind of see brotherhood. But like I said, self-care wasn't something that we talked about. Uh, as far as video, I mean, honestly, my first reaction is like mental health goes past suicide. And there's so much more. And I'm glad that they kind of went a little bit into it. But mental health can be just sitting down somewhere and taking a breather and it might not necessarily lead to suicide but you know that's that's what i think a lot of people really think about they think about the worst thing but sometimes it's just taking a breather going to get ice cream you know going to get a haircut which i haven't done in months you know something that's going to release some stress and make you feel better uh also one thing about the video uh one of the young men uh was actually one of my fraternity brothers i didn't know him personally but when he passed away, you know, we got nationwide emails from our grand chapter about uh, Mr. I think Young, I think is his name. And, uh, you know, we kind of have reflections like, 
what are we doing to prepare our young men who are making this transition into fraternity and sorority life? How are we preparing them to deal with mental anguish? Yeah, that's all I got. All right, thank you, Brother Pitts. And last but not least, um, have Dr. Richard Hansey. Same thing to you, brother. Hey, how you guys doing today? Uh, can you guys hear me? I just want to make sure. Okay. Uh, my name is Dr. Richard Hansey. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist here in the Bay Area. Uh, I specialize mostly now with working with uh, couples. So I work with a ton of couples. Uh, currently, uh, some of the biggest issues that I'm seeing now, you know, obviously infidelity, but financial issues, job loss, and now a lot of parents realize they don't really like their kids after being stuck in the house for six months with them. So, uh, you know, so those are some of the things that I deal with. And, and I just want to piggyback off what the previous speaker said about mental health is not just suicide. And we tend to focus on that so, so much. Um, but there is a lot of, especially in the African-American community, undiagnosed trauma, right? And, and we don't get to root that a, a lot of black men, if you grew up in inner city, struggle with PTSD, acute stress disorder. Uh, if they've been to prison, uh, you know, there's massive anxiety and depression coming out of prison, as well as health issues. So it, it, it's such a deeper uh, issue than we like to talk about because, again, I don't fall back on what Brother Khan said, is we struggle with machismo, right? We don't like to ask for help. We don't like to show that we're weak in any type of way. And in our efforts, we die young. So you know, my goal is to get the awareness out for, we need more African-American uh, providers, first of all, that's male, but we also need more of our brothers to come and seek help and, 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 and not to be criticized for it. You know, some of my uh, early experiences as a, as a young black man is that often the, the kid that was cool but not academically strong, was popular, and the kid that was academically strong was teased and picked on and bullied for being intelligent and thoughtful. And we got to start to change those narratives that we want to see the gains that we need to see as far as uh, African-American male providers and allowing African-American males to seek help. So that's what I'm here to want to get the word out and the message with. Okay. And, and the video, again, was very powerful. Thank you, Dr. Hanson. I didn't mean to cut you off, brother. I wanted to make sure. Okay, so now here's, here's the fun part for me, at least. Um, so I get to ask you, you brothers a couple of questions. And um, again, being considerate of the time, and I know I loaded you guys up, uh, you brothers up with some doozies, but I know all you can handle it. So I want to start with um, Professor Harris, you know, my mentor, my, my dignity. So the first question I have for you, sir, is um, with the proliferation of the cannabis industry, what are the ways in which this proliferation of cannabis has impacted black males' mental health? <laughs> you would give the drug counselor that question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, can I share screen? Can you enable me to share a screen or should I just wing it? Um, we'll see if the host could give you the, those permissions. Let's see if we... You did say do it, do it. Okay. Yeah, I actually had that answer. So let's see here. Well, basically, <clears throat> I, w I will wing it. <laughs> so basically with, um, I'm an addictions counselor and I'm also uh, a Native American as well as an African practitioner. So cannabis has been part of our pharmacology for easily 5,000 years. Um, that isn't so much the problem. Um, like Michael Franti of uh, the band Spearhead once uh, observed, the Buddha, meaning cannabis, elevates the stress off the chest, but could never elevate the boot off the ghetto necks. So part of what that means is, yes, it's a good stress reducer if you don't know any other skill or technique 
to reduce the stress of racism, daily life, all the pressures that uh, are part of our existence. But from a native perspective, yes, the little smoke marijuana does open up your vision initially, but if you use it too much, it clouds your vision. Then we also have to look at the fact that the drug laws in this country um, and other countries that we have been involved with, like South Africa, because South Africa took a lot of its apartheid laws from Jim Crow, and they associated DAGA, as they called it, with revolutionary freedom movements and banned its use. And when cannabis was legal up until 1930s, and when it was made illegal, it wasn't because of a public health problem. It was made illegal, and I quote Harry uh, Anslinger. He said, testified before Congress and said, coloreds with big lips induce white women to have sex with them using jazz music and marijuana. And that led to the passage of the Marijuana Tax Act, which actually didn't make marijuana illegal. It just taxed all the 32 different products, including anti-cancer and other types of drugs and made those illegal. And that kind of paved the way for other people to basically make the drug illegal. So that, for example, when my drug prevention field, when you have two Republicans using the same joke six months apart and they're saying when i was in high school the only people that used drugs were jazz musicians and people south of the border and i'm a jazz musician so that's a code for black people <laughs> and mexicans wait there's no mexicans in medford <laughs> in the time that you're in you know high school so when we look at the cannabis industry where lots of people have been incarcerated because of their drug sales, and then when it was made illegal, lots of white people make money from it. And then the way, the path to that economic um, opportunity is barred to black people largely because of drug convictions, even though black people at one point only have never exceeded their proportion in the population in terms of the drug use. The majority of drug users remain white people. So part of the cannabis industry is it's a double-edged sword where we have to learn uh, my phrase, pills are not skills. We need to learn the skills of self-soothing, self-care, independent, of whatever drugs may be available, because okay. that's it. Okay, thank you, thank you, Professor Harris. Um, I, I wanna go to um, my brother for the next question, Dr. Francis. Um, so there has been a proliferation of secularism, secular, secularism among black males in church. What, excuse me, what are some of the ways in which the church can resonate more with black males while serving as a conduit to other institutions, organizations, or individuals that might help black males with their mental health. Right. Uh, thank you uh, for that um, uh, that 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 question. And it's it's pretty it's pretty uh, loaded um, at this time. Um, let me just say this that um, let me let me talk about. Uh, briefly, uh, the role of the, the, the Black church uh, as it relates to Black male uh, mental health. Uh, now, we, we understand this, that uh, despite being um, exposed more frequently, Black men, uh, to a, a, a wide range of uh, stressors, um, we as Black men have a lower risk of depression compared to our white counterparts. And one of the reasons this is true is because um, Blacks tend to be um, more religious, and studies say that Blacks tend to be more religious than uh, their white counterparts. Um, and so 
the, the black church uh, still serves the black community, um, offering religious social supports within uh, that, that context to help with the struggles and stresses of life. Um, and so because of this, the, the black church um, stands as the, the, the epicenter, the, the center of black life. And it emerges from um, the rubbles of racism as a symbol of uh, black resilience and black resistance. And now, l let me say this before I, I talk about what the black church can do. One of the critiques of the, the, the modern black church is it has gone from um, agitation to accommodation. Um, and many black churches have uh, abandoned the social gospel for God of materialism, if that makes sense, a God of name it and claim it, uh, a, a, a God of have it and grab it. And we put picnics, potlucks, and plaques over people. And so because of that, the modern church have gone from being fishers of men uh, to being keepers of the aquarium, okay? Now, let's look at the black church as a whole. When we look at $14 million going through the black church and the resources that we would have, right? The black church would do better trying to build infrastructure. We are good at giving out information without truly building infrastructure. What I mean by that is the black church has to start looking at building more schools for their own, uh, hospitals, supermarkets, doing things like that. Um, and, and we need to get away from this whole concept of just doing black charity and start focusing on black empowerment. And so as a pastor for the last 17 years, we would give out backpacks and pencils to a number of kids in the community every single year. And we had no problem getting uh, large retailers to donate these pencils, backpacks, um, and crayons to kids. But then I stopped doing it. And one of the reasons why I stopped doing it is because I looked at the, the, the local schools and I looked at how black kids were performing in the local schools, especially black males who finished at the bottom. And what I realized is most of these kids could barely read. They could not read. And so here I am giving out backpacks and pencils to kids who need more than just charity, they need black empowerment. And so black men, because black men in this country have been marked for genocide and we are subject to second class citizenship in the institution of uh, healthcare and education in the criminal injustice system, black men are an endangered species, right? And we are the only endangered species in this country without national protection. And so, if a man measures, if we as men, we measure our manhood by the ability to protect and provide. And in, in this country, if our unemployment rate is almost twice as that of our white counterparts, then what the black church can do is say, wait a minute, we have to go ahead. And the, the reason why you have a hard time getting black men to come into church, you know, forget even offering mental health, but even coming to church is because we're not providing uh, the opportunity for men to be men. In other words, we have to provide the opportunity for black men to provide and protect their own, okay? And so- um, 15 seconds, Doc. 15 seconds. Huh? 15 seconds. Um, 15, 15 seconds. seconds? All yeah. right. And so uh, I'll just say this, black churches have to go back to the roots of the social gospel and we have to go ahead and, and provide opportunities for our men uh, so they can be men in the home uh, to protect and provide. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Francis. So Thank I want to go to um, Damian Pitts um, for the Pitts. So um, first question I have for you. There are dearth of black males working within our respective institutions. Um, as a student advisor with this, um, what, what specific advice would you give a black male regarding his academic trajectory with the limited, with the limited presence of other fathering, i.e., black males who serve in the capacity of a father that work in those institutions, as well uh, while symbiotically maintaining their healthy mental capacity? Uh, okay, I'm gonna try to answer those are a lot of big words. Like I said, I'm from Memphis, we won't talk like that. Uh, honestly, 
I mean, I think about myself and just my academic trajectory, even when I was in the military, and honestly, there weren't a lot of black people, black men or black women around in my field, nor in my, you know, my academic program. And I personally did not necessarily need someone who looked like me to guide me. Uh, but like I said, I realized that that's a privilege that I have that I'm able to navigate most spaces. And so I would say that if a young man, uh, black male is looking for that type of guidance or that mentorship, I mean, there's a, there's a chance, especially at predominantly white institutions, they might not find that in a, another black male. And either there is another black male there, they might not be that person to provide guidance. And so from an academic perspective, like these people who work on these institution, at these institutions are hired to help you. All right, like that's their job. That's what they're getting paid for. And it really should not matter what your skin tone, what your sexuality, or what uh, your gender is. We all know that that's not always the case. Uh, and it's very unfortunate, but the truth matters. I mean, I just tell people like, look, you know, make sure that you, one, you know what you're looking for because you can't always assume that somebody is black is gonna be able to you know, guide you. Like I think about my graduate student experience. My thesis advisor was black, but my department head was the only reason I even went to graduate school. And he was a white Jewish man. And he's the only one I even keep in contact with. And the wrong reason that I kept in contact with him because, excuse my language, he kept a foot up my butt nonstop, whereas my uh, black advisor didn't. Uh, and so that might not be what some of you want to hear, but I also, I really don't think that, uh, especially in higher education, especially at the University of Oregon, they might not find that mentor who looks just like them, but they can definitely find that mentor. And then maybe that, you know, me or somebody else could be just that person to check in on them, to talk about what it's like to be black. But we, we should expect our colleagues to be providing these same services to these students. And I think that happens way too much. We don't hold our white and uh, other race counterparts accountable uh, to support these students. Like I said, that's their job. And there have been multiple times when I've had to check somebody's like, look, yeah, he looks, he looks like me, but guess what? This is your field and you need to be doing this. Now it sucks that I have to even go that route with people, but I will. And so in closing, like I said before, uh, I, I, ne I don't consider myself a mentor, period. I will support you if I see something in you. I think mentorship is a partnership uh, to where I have to decide and that person has to decide. But then also when it comes to academics and stuff, especially PWIs, you might not be able to find anybody body that looks like you that can relate to you 100% but it is their job to support you and you need to make them support you. Okay. Thank you, Brother Pitts. Um, let me go to Brother Khan Johnson. First question I have for you. Um, so many, many inner city black males have an antagonistic orientation towards police. As a former police captain in a major city, San Francisco, what would you say to a black male that is having some cognitive dissonance regarding becoming a police officer. What I would say to a young black male, first, I, I, let me just try to couch my response this way. I want to just share with you a, a brief timeline, how I became a police officer. And I want to see we all can relate. Growing up black in inner city, San Francisco, at a time where the relationship between law enforcement and the black community, as is it did today, was strained and angst. I hated the police. I was the victim of police brutality at the age of 14 when I had long Lord Jesus. Some of you guys want to know about no Lord Jesus. <laughs> and out there just being myself, a bunch of kids hanging out, and I was got my butt kicked by a police officer. So not only did it was reinforced by the action of law enforcement, a police officer whooping my butt. It also planted the seed of disdain for law enforcement. As time went on, I was very fortunate 
to have a supporting cast to show me there was a difference between that particular officer there and how law enforcement functioned overall. So we have to be very mindful how law enforcement and police officers are perceived in the black community. For a lot of black males, we have to recognize that that feeling of antagonistic attitude towards toward law enforcement, that hatred, that disdain is real. And so we have to acknowledge that feelings to the point where we can try to give a counterbalance to it. For instance, one of the things I think we can do as, as stewards in trying to give guidance to young men. And, and by the way, this is not just about trying to become a police officer. The same process should be applied to trying to become a doctor or a lawyer because the position that I take is applied to any position you want to achieve. We just so happen to be talking about police officer, becoming a police officer. One, I think it was very important to meet young black men where they're at. They are in the hood. And a lot of times we got this romanticism that somehow they can pull themselves up by the bootstraps if only if they can get into a good program, for instance, or get a mentor. I think the brother spoke about that earlier. That's not always the case. I think by and large, we have to be able to acknowledge the fact that those resources, that pathway is very murky, if you will. So the first thing we have to do is pretty much start to work with young black men where they at in the hood. That means that you gotta be able to give them alternatives. You have to be able to show them different viewpoints. For instance, how I used to work in the hood, the, the, the ghetto, if you will, and I asked young black men, how many of them saw a deer or been to the, the redwoods or saw snow or been to Treasure Island? And none of them said no. So our black men, our young boys live on an island. We have to find a way to expand that island so we can expand their mind. Everything that we do first starts with a perception in our mind, how we feel, how we think starts in the mind. So we gotta get, in terms of our mental health, we gotta meet young brothers where they're at, give them those tools of trying to expand their experiences, other than being drug dealers, being exposed to violence on a continuous basis, being in poor environments where the only thing you can get is some bad food from the grocery store if you have one. We gotta begin to start to counter those environmental factors that's going to create a negative perspective, perspective of law enforcement. The, the second thing I would say that we have to do, we have to be consistent. Too often than not, we just come out, show up in a program and then ab abort the mission. And then we begin to, that young boy sees us not committed to him. And if we are not committed to that young boy, why should he be committed to trying to become a doctor or a lawyer or a police officer? So we gotta ask black men especially, and I do, I wanted to say something, it is important that a child see his reflection. It is important for that child to have that bond between man and boy, because it's us. We have the awesome responsibility to be able to make sure and navigate that boy from boyhood to manhood. And if we can't identify that young man and make a connection to him so he can understand that I am his reflection and he is mine, then we can't be begin to talk about how to become a police officer. The third thing is we got to make sure for me. Got 30 seconds, brother. 30 seconds. That we got to change that not all police officers are bad, just like not all black men are gangsters or thugs. So in those three areas there, I think that becomes the way and methodology in terms of changing the attitude about law enforcement for young black men and making it more positive in their interaction. Okay. All right. Thank you, Brother Khan. So now this is a really loaded question that I have for this next two are, are heavy. So I'm going to um, Dr. Hansi. Um, and so I'm, I'm setting this up with a quote from um, Dr. Robert Staples. Um, work from males in, I heard males in American society back in 1982. And when I read this, I think you'll, you might ask, did he write this in 2020? Um, but let me set up the question and let me go into um, this. And again, this is um, for um, Dr. Richard Hansi. So the problems black men and women have in their relationship often are shaped by external forces. 
Many have been unable to form monogamous family due to structural impediments. In society where money is the measure of the man, many black males are excluded as potential mates because, because they lack the economic wherewithal to support a family in a reasonable manner. Given the traditional role definitions for a woman, definitions internalized by black males, the highly educated black woman finds herself victimized by the fact that she has a higher educational and income level than most of the black men in her pool of eligibility. Um, again, that's from Dr. Robert Stable, um, males, in African, males in American Society. So the question, based on the aforementioned, how would you suggest that black males go about marriage when they're often in a high, um, Hypo hypogamous, that means they are not making as much money as the sister is, right? How can they go about, um, how should they go about um, marriage when they're in that predicament? And that, that is a loaded question, you know that though, right? I know you can handle it, brother. You got two PhDs. All right. <laughs> All right. So so let's go, I want to go back to the question itself. And, and the statement that you made was victimized. All right. Ugh victimized uh, so so it's basically the simple the simple answer to that question is that the african-american male marries a woman that makes less money than him or makes money at the same level right if that's if that's if that's the standard for them to get married but so you're basically saying that for african-american women to achieve a level of success is either you gotta choose between success or marriage. And that, that's not right, right? Your partner is based on a set of standards. I, I think the biggest problem is this. So, so it's what standard the woman or man set for themselves. So if, if I'm a if I'm an African American woman that makes over $120,000 a year and say, and, and this and this and also the biggest point, this question is very, very regional. Okay. We're talking about the San Francisco Bay Area. It's probably one of the third or fourth highest places in America to live. Now, I'm from a small town called Gibson, Louisiana, where forty five thousand dollars a year, you got you two acres in a four bedroom house. So forty five thousand, right? If I'm the cable guy, I'm I'm living good down there. But you come to the Bay Area where $95,000 a year, you still, with two kids, you right at the poverty level. So it's a very regional question. So it depends on, first, where the black woman lives at. So knowing what we know and the information that's available, if a black woman sets the standard to where I need to, I need to meet a man that makes $100,000 a year, okay? Not necessarily... It, that's not based on how I connect with that man. Are our spiritual beliefs the same? Do we feel the same about raising children, right? It's just based completely on finances, then that's kind of a hollow marriage. Now, what if I make $100,000 a year as a black woman and my husband is a, is a great father, a great leader, but he's a janitor at the local school district and he makes $65,000 a year. So, so if it's, if it's now men as men, we've been doing this forever. There's a lot of men that make a lot of money who marry women that uh, don't work at all or, you know, make significantly less to spend time with dealing with the kids. So there's a little bit of role reversal. So I think the problem is not so much how much the man makes. It's the image that people want to see. Like, I guess women feel if they make more than their husband. They can't be proud of him because of his finances or my friend married a man that makes this amount of money or we can't go on these amount of vacations. So it is really, it, what really matters, it, what's really important is what matters to you, the character of the person or how much money they make. So if you're building your, if you're building your marriage on finances, it's going to fail. If, if, you know, there's not a level of whatever your spiritual beliefs is, whether it's Islam, Christianity, you guys got to be one in your spiritual beliefs, one in your morals and values, and how you want to raise your family. But if it's just being judged on finances, then that's a problem. But again, 
Now we got to get back to the reality of the situation. <laughs> All right. If you live in the Bay Area where the cost of living is significant, right? As a black man, if you if, if you want to be a single black man and, and only look after yourself, don't have a family. Then you won't have those pressures of being a provider. But if you're out there making babies and you have to provide for your family, then you have to be responsible. So, so my thing as a black man is if I want to have a family and a wife and I know those responsibility, then I have to be responsible to myself and my family to go and get a career that, that pays a, a, a amount of money that I can be a good provider. Because we all know, if you're a parent, one of the worst things that can happen to you is your kid come to you on Christmas or a birthday and say, Daddy, I want a PlayStation or some Jordans, and you know you don't got the money for that, right? That, that definitely impacts a black male mental health, right? You feel less <laughs> than because you know you can't provide for your child. But the problem is we don't get a lot of education outside of basketball player on careers, basketball player, rappers, uh, doctor, lawyer. It's either, it's either all these careers are so high and, and no one says the number one job in California right now, the fastest growing job is physical therapists, right? Physical therapists. We first had the nursing shortage. Now we have a physical therapist shortage. You go on any job site, hospital, or county website, they all got multiple openings for physical therapists. Okay, brother. We're going to have to leave it right there, unfortunately. But thank you. I, I, I just know uh, I'm going to my brother T. Hassan next, um, who could have, I could have gave him that question as well. Um, <laughs> but I have something. I, I saw you, brother. I saw you. <laughs> I saw you, but let me get into your question with all due respect. Um, and this comes from our, our, our mutual good brother, Dr. Tommy Curry, his seminal work um, from the man not. So I'm gonna frame your question with a, um, with a piece from his, his work, um, his book. So, and these are Dr. Tommy Curry's words. So black male vulnerability is a term I use to capture the disadvantages that black males endure compared with other groups, the erasure of black males, actual lived experience from theory and violence to the death of black males suffering society. The term is not meant to simply express the material disadvantages black males face due to incarceration, unemployment, police brutality, homicide, domestic and sexual abuse throughout society or their victimhood. The term is also meant to express the vulnerable conditions, the sheer fungibility of the black male as living in terrors, able to, able to be killed, raped, or, de, or, de, or dehumanized at any moment, given the disposition of those who encounter him. All right, again, that's from our, our brother, Dr. Curry, the man not. So, um, so Dr. Hassan, could you deconstruct the ways in which black males can engage in some good vulnerabilities um, that may ameliorate their mental health? Well, I, I think there's a couple ways to answer the question and <clears throat> on a number of levels. Uh, first, I think uh, grappling and accepting vulnerability in and of itself, despite uh, what can be even hostility in the, in the social environment in, in terms of doing so. So accepting vulnerability to the degree that you're willing to express even that which no one wants to hear, right? Um, being able to come forward about experiences, particularly experiences uh, with trauma, experiences with victimization. I don't care if it has to do with sexual assault and rape or if it has to do with, um, you know, abuse. It has to do with, you know, being able to come forward and do that unapologetically. I talk a lot with my students about um, the experiences and the statistics around black men engaged in a variety of different types of vulnerabilities. And, and I find that the more I do it, uh, the more willing, excuse me, I always forget to look over here, the more willing uh, people are to come forward about their own experiences. So I think being forthright about our vulnerabilities is, is one area. Uh, also dealing with uh, success as a social experience rather than solely as a product of one's own individual will. That's an important aspect of it. We talk about success and work in the black community 
as solely a product of our own individual work. Example of which being uh, students that often come in first year. What I often find is they tend to study by themselves, whereas other groups study in groups. And so I often have to urge my students, my black students in particular, to work in groups so that they can actually support one another, as opposed to being isolated and siloed off competing. And that's just an example, but I think that example is mirrored in a lot of different other contexts where we're used to working in isolation when we actually do need to develop a more collective framework. Another area is I would say to challenge gaslighting, meaning there are very real structures, barriers, and issues that Black men in particular face to degrees that other groups, even within the Black community, don't face. And we're often told that they don't exist. We're often told that we're imagining things. It's a very real type of gaslighting that tends to take place that we have to challenge about what we're really grappling with and to what extent it impacts us. So when we talk about, for example, the, the issue you just raised about, you know, marriage and the issue you raised about, you know, income and so on and so forth, prior to the, the pandemic, in 30 major cities, black males found themselves unemployed to 40 and 50, to degrees of 40 and 50%, right? That's prior to the, the pandemic. And we know by February, half of black America lost their jobs. And in the, in the last month, half of America lost their jobs. So where does that place black men at the bottom of that pile? So if we're going to have these discussions and we're going to, you know, talk very gingerly about victimization, but we're not really going to get into the real world barriers that black men face, then it's, it's, uh, it's going to be a difficult conversation to have that doesn't grasp the reality of the black male experience. Also, um, acquiescing to the, the, the barriers as they pertain to media, the barriers as they pertain to academic theory, these things directly impact black males. So whether you want to talk about um, media, like I think just this last couple of weeks, there was a film came out on, on Netflix by Nia Long and Omar Epps called Fatal Affair, where yet, yet again, pictures black men, positions black men as these, you know, uh, killers, murderers, rapists, so on kind of thing, you know, stalking people and so on and so on. Despite that, you know, in many instances, the data points to black men as actually being more progressive than other groups, particularly other groups of men, alongside being good fathers and so on and so forth. So the, there's, in the data itself, there's plenty that shows that black men are actually on the other end of the spectrum, but we constantly have this repeating stream of stereotyping that goes on. And the stereotypes themselves have really not changed in any substantive way since the 19th century. And we're still grappling with these ideas and they're still being propagated in popular media, but they're also being propagated in academia and even in activism, right? If you look at the works like, uh, I think it's Ijoma Oloyu's book, uh, So You Want to Talk About Race, she actively talks about silencing men of color. And most particularly, we're talking about black men in those instances, or whether you want to talk about, uh, you know, activism and organizations that we've seen since 2015 that have kind of propagated this idea that black men are the problem, black men have to step back, and this legacy of patriarchy and privilege associated with black men. And when you start to delve at what they're actually talking about, the privilege is that we're acknowledging? Oh, let me cut you off. Let me cut you off because that's that's on my next question. So you you you, yeah, you, you, on. you asked me the question. You gonna give right, us bro. a little bit? You gonna <laughs> give us two for one, brother? Hold up, hold up. They got okay. to wait for that. So All right. uh, well, the, that so I'll leave it at that then. Okay, appreciate that. Excellent commentary, man. Y'all on fire, man. Y'all on fire, brothers. So let's go to the second uh, question. I believe I got everybody for that first round. Um, man, this this is beautiful. So let me go to Professor Harris um, for his second question um, that I have for him. Uh, this is a personal question. Uh, the, the host has to activate my camera. OK. Oh, so maybe. Because I tried. And it says, unable to start video. All right. So we'll, we'll get you. I'll start reading the question. Okay. All right. Okay. There, there we, we go. We'll see, we'll see you okay. now. Go All for right. it. <laughs> so, and again, this is kind of like a personal uh, question, but I think it would be good for everybody here. So you often say that our current geographical location in the great Pacific Northwest is a great place to study institutional racism. What advice would you <laughs> offer black males navigating our geographical confines that are experiencing what Fanon coined the zone of non -B? Um, well, since you referenced him, I'd say that they should do what I did at 13 and read Black Skin, White Masks. Then Wretched of the Earth. 
and uh, finish off, especially if they're college age, but even if they're high school age, with Derek Bell's uh, Faces at the Bottom of the Well, The Space Traders, any number of books. So the zone of non-being from a black skin, white mask is simply is you enter majority white space and it's a zone that doesn't see you at all. It's like you, the, like Ellison's Invisible Man or sees you as a danger unless you put on a mask and talk white or whatever and speak in a white voice uh, that conveys safety for them and doesn't necessarily challenge white supremacy if they see you at all. So talking about race, talking about issues of inequity, uh, doing what John Lewis did all his life and other people did all their life. Um, they may not really see you. So like Paul Robeson said, uh, and he came to Eugene and gave a speech in the center of the black community at the time in 1949. The man who accepts Western values absolutely finds his creative faculties becoming so warped and stunted that he's almost completely dependent on external satisfactions. And the moment he becomes frustrated in his search for these, he begins to develop neurotic symptoms to feel that life is not worth living, and in chronic cases, to take his own life. So that speaks to what the video was showing at the front. People want to kill themselves when they feel hopeless, or engage in suicide by cop, or engage in auto genocide, using drugs, gang behavior, et cetera, et cetera. So what Fanon and Paul basically are saying is, you shouldn't take your mental health cues or your ideas of what is mentally healthy from people who don't think that you're human or capable of being human, let alone healthy and have a voice in determining what your health is. Uh, that's basically what the Confederacy is. And I'm saying is, cause it didn't go away, <laughs> you know? is what its heritage is and what the constitution says as well, okay? You're not equal to us, but you have to think of yourself as fully human and the standard of what being, we are the original humans. You know, humanity learned a lot of what is civilized from us. And so when we basically expand beyond the confines of what America's limits are, we're greater. All right. Thank you, Professor Harris. All right. Let me go to Dr. Francis for, um, actually, he's essentially your third question. But um, so, as a Black pastor and a Black um, administrator, which dynamic of Black male mental health do you feel receives the least amount of attention and why? And what can be done to ensure? that this dynamic is readily addressed as it pertains to the amelioration of black males and mental health. Okay, real quick, because I, I know I don't want to run out of time. Um, just continuing from what I was talking about the, the, the last time about the, the black church and mental health, and then I'm gonna address your question in a second. Um, there are a lot of black men that attend uh, churches that don't attend churches that feel spiritually incarcerated because you have a lot of mega churches with a minor touch and they're not really touching the black men where they need to be touched, okay? And so we have a lot of black churches who are spiritually trying to get people ready for heaven while you have a lot of people down here experiencing hell, right? And so, so black churches have to go from begging to building and really start building infrastructure for their, their people. Now, you look at the three components to uh, mental health. Uh, emotional well-being, psychological, and social well-being. I would say psychological uh, well-being is the one, the, the part that is least neglected um, in schools and also the churches. And the reason why I say that is because psychological hurt is easy to hide, right? And, um, and, and we are only as sick as our secrets. And so because we can go around and we can hide it, um, uh, oftentimes it's not 
addressed. Let me let me let me do this. Um, let, let's go to church for the next few moments. In um in 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 in, in First Samuel chapter nineteen, there was a man by the name of Saul. Saul was a man that stood head and shoulders above everybody. Very handsome individual. Um, but he was not the man he used to be. And there was a young man coming up uh, by him by the name of David. And Saul, the reason why I, I talked about Saul is because Saul had some mental health issues that were undiagnosed. He was not the man he used to be. And because as black men, our value is, was, was historically tied to our physical prowess or our physical output, and he could no longer produce, he felt less value. And so he recruits David to play the harp, but here is Saul sitting on the throne with a spear, okay? And so here he is in the most guarded place around loved one, yet he's still always in fight mode, right? And, 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 and unfortunately, because he, is, he, he did not have the proper diagnosis, right? Um, here he is always ready to fight, right? Now we know by the end of his life, he, he finds himself in battle and he is wounded by arrows. Okay? And once he realized he is fatally wounded, then he throws himself on his own sword and he commits suicide, right? Now, before he does that, he is critically wounded by arrows, which, which means that is damage done from a distance. And a lot of times, damage is done from a distance through social media, or through other, other means where we feel like we can no longer go on, we have nowhere to, 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 to go to because we have to put on this kingly persona with other people. And so he goes ahead and he throws himself on his own sword and he ends up dying. And there are so many souls uh, in the church, in the schools, in our society that we normally don't address. So I think it's very important that we address the, the psychological, especially in the schools. One of the ways we can do it, uh, Dr. Rashid, is to definitely get mental health for black young black men in the elementary schools where you have white females, white middle class females represent over 90% of the elementary school teachers in this country. We need more people that look like us. But to, to go off of what uh, Mr. Pitt said, look, you know, we just don't need black teachers just to have black teachers because all skin folk and kin folk, just because they are color, doesn't mean they're our kind. And some of the worst damage that have been done to black kids have been done by black educators. But we need black, we do need black educators that are uh, emotionally black, psychologically black, because blackness is more than a skin color, it's a political statement that are interested in the upliftment of our people. And, and so we need black men in those positions to start doing groups, start doing therapy and start identifying issues at an early age um, so that um, we, we're not dealing with uh, men who are broken. We can start looking at uh, young people that, that have those issues um, and start getting mental health where it's needed. So that's... I hope did I run out of time? No, you good. You, you oh, man. Right on time. Okay. Right on time. Excellent. Okay, so right. so but just let me let me I, I love what uh, brother Hassan said. Um uh that success seconds. is a social ex, uh, experience. And so we have to do what, what we have to do is learn how to build community in uh, amongst black men. Uh and, and like I'll leave you with the old saying. They they used to say, if you want to go faster, go alone, but if you want to go further, go together. And so we have to learn to to work and go together. Okay, appreciate that, Doc. Okay, Thank brother. You. All right, let me go to Mr. Pitts. Um, so now I'm going to clarify my statement that I made earlier regarding Mr. Pitts with this question. So your roots, or we said your roots, um, stem from the South. In the South, Black fraternal organizations are pretty much the norm. However, here in the great Pacific Northwest, there are not an abundance of Black fraternal organizations. What would you convey to a black male that is frustrated about the lack of fraternal organization? Uh, honestly, I mean, this is something that uh, myself and, and Brother Moore have, have talked about constantly, and it's just a different culture. And so for those of you on the call who don't know, I'm a member of Cap Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. When I was growing up, I was a member of their Kappa Leadership League. And so uh, I knew that I was going to be a Kappa. Now, granted, I went to the Army right out of the high school, and that wasn't happening then. And in uh, undergrad, because of mental health issues and trying to reintegrate back into society from being a combat veteran to 
just a regular human again, uh, being in any organizations wasn't a thing that I wanted to do in undergrad. And so I ended up joining while I was in graduate school. Uh, but to go back to your question, I, 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 I understand the frustration, but I will also put it back on them. You know, a lot of conversations I have with young men is like, man, you know, if I would have went to HBCU, then this and that, it's like, well, guess what? You're not at HBCU, so let's make it happen here. Uh, and, and I understand the frustration, but a lot of the reasons that the organizations aren't here is because, like I said, I love my brothers, but sometimes they just don't step up. We can depend on uh, our young black women, specifically at the U of O, to show up to things when our black men don't. And so when they say they're frustrated, honestly, I would call them on it. Now, for those of you who know me, I don't sugarcoat anything, uh, which some people like it and some people don't. And I can see it being very off-putting, but if they really want that experience, one, they need to realize that this ain't the South, this ain't Stump the Yard, and this these organizations are about doing work, not stepping, not strolling, not getting the girls, not twirling the cane. I mean, that might be a byproduct of it, but, you know, I, and I tell a lot of these black young men, like, hey, it'd be great if you were in my fraternity or another fraternity, but I need you to graduate. I don't give a damn about no fraternity. I need you to be safe here in Eugene, Oregon, and I need you to graduate. Now, if you end up becoming a part of, you know, my organization, that's great. And I'm going to support you whether you decide to do my organization, another organization, no organization at all, because we need each other. But you're here to go to school. That's most important. And so take your frustration out on them books and them internships and those professional development opportunities and do that first. And then we can talk about how to get you tapped into these organizations. All right. Thank you, brother. I, I'm, I'm going to do a little curveball. I'm going to let um, our host, AP, um, slide in here, make some quick commentary regarding a specific question. Um, go ahead, brother AP. Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, you got me off the question. So basically, I was asking, you know, like down south, you know, there's, there, I mean, black fraternal organizations are the norm. I mean, we see them everywhere. Coming from HBCU like you did, I mean, it was nothing to see, you know, the bros everywhere, right? But being here in the great Pacific Northwest, you know, there's there's not a whole lot of them, right? And so what would you suggest or what would you convey to a uh, black male who's frustrated by the lack of, you know, black fraternal organizations? Got it. Um, so as you said, I, I am a one, I'm a member of Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated, um, and I also do the 10 and HBCU in the South. However, I am from California. And so I think this question, and really um, this is a West Coast um, really issue. Um, I know that when I came from Sacramento to go to Atlanta, I was not aware of a fraternal organization outside of the fact that my guidance counselor told me to apply for a scholarship because I was a young black male and a fraternity was giving me free money. However, when I stepped on campus and I saw what the organization, who those gentlemen were, what they were doing, that is what then brought me to where I am. Now, when you talk about being here in the Pacific Northwest and frustration, I will uh, wholeheartedly double down on what Brother Pitts uh, is talking about. Although I don't get to work with students directly, a lot of my alumni that I work with, um, specifically within our Black alumni group, um, have some type of uh, Greek letter organization affiliation. However, that was in their time, but they're not here now. And that's because the students that are currently on campus are not upholding the traditions of the organization's needs as well as to Damien's point, we're not stepping up to make sure that those organizations are staying on campus and are thriving. Um, and so although it is an important piece, I think the experience is, um, it was beneficial and it was very helpful. Um, I'm with Damien 100%. When you get to school, the goal is to finish. Uh, these other things are ancillary you can get them done if it's something that you're truly passionate about during your time in college or once you finish at graduate school or 
once you finish in your in your regular life. Um, so that's where I would say, you know, your frustration is warranted. Uh, but unless you want that change to happen, you got to one, find enough folks to help get that organization off the ground. But then two, you need to channel that energy into something that's going to be more beneficial for your life okay. in the long haul. All right. Thank you, Brother AP. Since everybody's shouting out, you know, their fraternal organization, might as well shout out that A5, that good old six, you know, that bloody gamma delta, that bloody gamma delta, you know what I mean? That, you know, so since we're doing that, just might as well say that, you know, University of Arkansas Pine Bluff, HBCU, you know. But anyway, let's go back to what we were supposed to be doing. Thanks for that, AP. We threw out a little curveball. Those of you listening got a little extra. Um, so let me go to my brother Khan right now in all seriousness. Um, what advice would you offer black males that are consistently, and this is all of us on this, this, this call right now, um, what advice would you offer black males that are consistently dealing with the trauma associated with police brutality and the killing of other black males? Wow. I, I think for me, the question is much broader than that. We live in a society based on white supremacy where white, black life has little value, if any. So the fact that you have police brutality you have to understand how that came to be. Police brutality is nothing more than white supremacy being exercised on black bodies and, 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 and in a way with impunity. So my, my advice to there is first acknowledge how black, how police brutality comes into play. This goes way back in the history of slavery where law enforcement was used to retrieve that property for that master by any means necessary, including killing and lynching of black bodies. And so when you fast forward, there's a inherent um, implicit way to control a people through violence. We are associate and are controlled by that idea that if you don't comply, then I have the authority to take what you may perceive as value, but has no value to me, which means your life. So when you start to see the easiness of how law enforcement or police can take your life, you got to go back to the whole system overall, because in this system, in terms of capitalism, black lives is at the bottom of the value system. We are a value driven system and capitalism for the most part sees black people as being invaluable. Why I'd say that, because we don't control anything. We don't have, we don't control the power of the means of production. We don't control the power of business in our community. We don't even control the story where we go to shop at. So until we start to change that narrative, until we start to add value to ourselves, that now will give you an example. Do you think that in San Ramon, which is a very affluent area, that you're gonna have some police brutality when one of those people gets stopped who's driving that Maserati by police? Do you think that's gonna happen? Not, and I tell you the answer to that is no, because there is great value, not only because they are white, it's because they have something that black folks are seem to be lacking, is money. Money is the power to neutralize police brutality. Why is that? Because when you start to be able to use resources through the means of having money, you can now control what type of actions that's gonna be perpetrated against you. That's number one, capitalism. Someone says that, you would talk about relationships earlier, earlier. They said that romance without finance is a nuisance. And so that is very, it is true. We, we, we have to begin to understand the importance of what that means because most of us, we live in an environment where we don't learn the, 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 the fundamental principles of capitalism. And it's not a bad thing because we live in the system. So my first thing is to, if you, the further you remove yourself from any contact or the probability of having contact with officers or police, it minimizes the need for or the result of police brutality. You follow me? Most police are going to police poor black areas. That's where you see a heightened level of police brutality because you're going to have a heightened level of contact. And so what we, I always promote, and I'm a firm believer, that we have to give our young brothers the skill set necessary to remove themselves further from police contact. Number two. I'm always saying that we got to strive for excellence. 
we are going to some of the greatest institutions. Um, you talk, your brother's talking about fraternities, or I'm not a, I'm not a member of any type of, what you call it, you know, I'm just trying to be black. But, but you know, but we got to strive for excellence. We got to begin to learn those same traits that applies to every human being in terms of trying to become better people, better human beings. Because I'm a firm believer in the fact that police brutality is only going to be perpetrated to against those individuals who they perceive to be cheapened. That's where we have the birth of Black Lives Matter. The third That's thing is, real quick, I real think, quick. 15 seconds. The first thing, the third thing is, is fear. False evidence appearing to be real. We got to get over our fear factors. And I think the brother, the two brothers mentioned earlier, we got to stick to the to the grind. Our job is to make sure that we improve all this other stuff that has nothing to do with trying to become better, get that degree. I think that's what we need to have in terms of messaging and, and change that image. Okay. That's how you stop the loose brutality. Okay. Thank you, Brother Johnson. Um, let me go to Dr. Hansi. Um, another loaded question. Again, I'm, I'm throwing them on you. Um, so, and this comes from the book by Coles and Green, The Myth of the Missing Black Father. So, um, there are a lot of tropes regarding the black father, regarding black fathers. The black male, a demographic, um, a social, a, a social, can I say the word? A sociological construct, a media caricature, a crime statistic. Aside from rage or lust, he is seldom seen as an emotional embodied person, rather a father. Indeed, if one, if one judged by popular and academic coverage, one might think the term black fatherhood an oxymoron. In the parenting role, African-American men are viewed as verbs, but not now. That is frequently assumed that black men father children, but are seldom, but, but seldom are fathers. Again, this comes from the book, um, The Myth of the um, Missing Black uh, Father, Coles and Green, 2010. So uh, with that being said, um, Dr. Hansey, what would, you what would you suggest black males, excuse me, how would you suggest black males approach fatherhood while maintaining their um, mental health wellness? I, I, do me a favor one more time, Dr. Rasheed. Read yeah. the name of the book out loud. Yeah, so the name of the book is The Myth of the Missing Black Father by Coles and Green, 2010. It, exactly. It's a myth. That's right? the title. Yes. Right? Yes. Uh, statistically, black non-residential black men spend more quality time, spend more uh, more. Uh, like we call actively involved, you know, taking the kid to the park, spending time with them, taking them to the movies, teaching them how to play sports. Then white fathers, white non-residential fathers, Hispanic non-residential fathers, and Asian American, right, Res non-residential fathers. So it's a myth, right? So it's it's a construct. But yes, the the reality the reality is there are still because African American women. Uh, make up 70% of all African American children are born out of wedlock, right? So 70% of the kids born in the African American community are born without, you know, the mom and dad living in the same home. So that, that myth continues off that statistic. Like, okay, the vast majority of black kids are being born without being in a two-parent household, but that does not mean that the father is not actively involved. Now, obviously, the higher the education the father, the more involvement the father has in, in his child's life. So basically, if, if we're gonna associate uh, academics with being able to provide, the more a father can provide, the more the father can work. Now, if you read my dissertation, the number one barrier to African-American father involvement is what? The African-American mother. And in every study that you find, not just mine, that you see, the biggest hindrance is the co-parenting relationship between that father and that mother. So the, the one thing we want to address is, if, especially in the black community, and, and, and this is something I would charge to all black churches in African-American communities 
simply having co-parenting classes because the co-parenting classes come from the judge. And, and, and when you're going to take a black father and put in a lot of the co-parenting uh, uh, facilitators are white or white women. So we, we know what happens in a custody battle, right? There's a lot of inflammatory statements being made about the other party. You know, there's a lot of demonizing. So when, when I get a paper from a mother that's saying that this father is a bad guy, he's a drug addict, extremes, he fights, and their mind is already made up. You ask most black fathers before they get to that custody hearing, the people that sitting across from them are already against them. And it's their job to convince the person that's there to be a facilitator that they're not a demon. So the cards are already stacked against them. So, and for a black, you know, a lot of times we already deal with black male stress as is to compete in society, to deal with the barriers that we face all the negative stereotypes. And yet when we go, we got to all now we got to fight to be with our kids, right? So it does, as far as black male mental health, a lot of men do give up. Unfortunately, that's what happens, right? Because if you lose that custody battle, we all know what that means. Then that means your child support is gonna skyrocket. Now you have to figure out how I'm gonna take care of myself. Maybe I have other kids. And now I, I don't even feel comfortable anymore going back to the same courthouse where I've been misjudged. Like they've already shown favor to the mother. So I, I can't win. But there's no organization. Show me where there's in any community, in any state, where there's an organization that, so, that supports black male father fatherhood in custody battles and teaching them the laws and their rights and their requirements from the black church, from the community organization. Faith, faith, 15, seconds, 15 seconds, brother. 15 seconds. So we have to stop talking about it. We have to start creating these organizations that teach us our rights so we can get more actively involved in our children's lives. But the fathers that fought the system, they know it can be done. But honestly, it is an uphill battle from day one. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Okay, I know I'm going to get some hate mail talking about we hate no sisters. That's not what we're <laughs> just keep it up. We just keeping it a buck. I mean, these are scholars. These are academicians. These are PhDs and everything. They come in with the, with the flame and everything. We love our sisters, so that's don't, do. don't come at we me do. with that. Um, and this is a perfect segue into my brother, Dr. T. Hassan. Um, because I saw him nodding his head and everything. I think I set this up really well. I'm not giving myself a pat on the back, but it just worked out that way. So he was already going to answer this question. You know, he got ESPN or something, but um, we gonna go into it right now. So the question from my brother is, um, you have written this excellent essay, although may, some may say that it's controversial title, you know, I love it. It's titled, Some Black Men May Be Jerks, but black male privilege is not a thing. Challenging the myth of black male privilege. So with that title, how would you advise black males to challenge this axiomatic, mimetic trope of white patriarchy in our current, um, in our current um, cancel culture milieu? Well, I mean, first and foremost, I can say that part of the issue we're dealing with as you know, Dr. Hansey broke down in his answer, we're dealing with myth. And one of the myths on the table is not only that black males are more privileged, you know what I mean, but also that black males seek to mimic white ma males and white masculinity. That's a, that's a myth, that's not the case. Black men haven't, and you can look throughout history and see that that's not been the case. But here's the other part to that. We lack the actual institutional means to do it, even if we try. We don't have the mechanisms in place we are not able to dominate or oppress any particular group. We lack the, the, I mean, we just don't have the, we don't have the inherited wealth. We don't have the structural institutions. None of that is realistic. As a matter of fact, one of the things I was thinking about when Dr. Hansey was answering the question, uh, when he was talking about, you know, the, the family courts and the kind of judgments that tend to, to levy against black men, one of the things that came to mind when you, when you said, well, you know, let's be clear, we're not hating on the sisters. The reality is, whether you're talking about you know, media, whether you're talking about the academy, whether you're talking about publishing institutions, what, and, and, all, and even if you're talking about churches, in each of these areas, you're talking about institutions that when it comes to the black community, focus on their primary demographic, meaning the demographic that, that pays its bottom line. By and large, that's not black men. It's not. So I, I think earlier, I think it was Dr. Francis, is that how you pronounce it? Mm -hmm. who, who made mention that, you know, churches don't always advise black men well. Well, 
that's not their primary demographic. The primary demographic in most Christian churches in the United, Black, United States and the Black community are women. So oftentimes pastors will target their message there. If you're talking about media, the primary groups that consume media are women across race, but in the black community, they tend to be black women. So in, in a, across a, a variety of institutions, we're in a capitalist system, they focus on who the dollar is coming from. And more often than not, black women tend to be more consistently employed. So this is part and parcel to why there's so much focus on it either excluding black men from the discourse, ignoring them altogether, unless their deaths, for example, serve other demographics. The reason for that shift is because we're not the primary focus of where they're, they're receiving their income from. So that's part of the discourse. It doesn't have to be about you know hating on black women. It's just that we're responding to the institutions that by and large put us in a vulnerable position because we're not their primary focus. So I, I, I kind of you know will leave it there as far as that. But uh, oh, yeah, no, thank you, brother. That that was well, well, uh, man. The commentary is on fire. So, um, what I think we should do right now, and I'm I'm going to really go back to AP. I, I've been trying to follow all all, all the conversations, but I, I think you know I've I've given questions to specific panelists, and I think some other panelists may may have wanted to opine about the question that I asked. And so, and I'm going to ask my MC because again, he's the one that holds it everything together. Maybe if it's okay if we give brothers maybe you know three minutes each to address maybe a question that they heard from their perspective, um, and then we definitely want to again we want to get to the audience who's been waiting at the bits to ask you brothers um, you know their questions. So how, how you brothers feel about that? AP is that cool? Uh, you know about them. That sounds good. Um, so I will uh, ask that our technical team allow the brothers to uh, be unmuted. And then if there was a question that you would like to um, respond to, please let me know. I will uh, let, go ahead and give you three minutes. Also, for everyone that is listening in, if you have any questions, you've already been doing a great job of using the question and answer uh, feature within Zoom. So if there are any questions that we have not either gotten to in the chat uh, that you would like for us to uh, answer uh, throughout the rest of the night, please utilize that function and I will go ahead and uh, ask those questions. So um, I'm going to open the floor. Uh, so was there a question that uh, Dr. Rashid gave earlier that someone would like to give an additional uh, some comments too, and if you are, just let me know, and then I will start your three minute time period. There was, but I can't remember the questions now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know. <laughs> there were a couple of them actually. Yeah, I know. See, unfortunately, this is where uh, Dr. Rashid did not give me those questions in mm -hmm. advance because those were his questions. Um, however, uh, I can. I take... have a. Yes, sir. Dr. Johnson. Dr. Johnson, can you just elaborate for the next three minutes? How do we now, and by the way, brother, that's some powerful um, answers you gave in terms of institutionals that we don't, the institutions that we don't control. Can you elaborate, how do we now navigate and deal with institutions that we don't control? And I, if you get my question. Um, were there any particular ones you had in mind or what you I, just I'm just speaking in general. I mean, your response in, in terms, we don't own or have any control over these institutions that have control over our bodies. Mm -hmm. That being said, how do we begin to <clears throat> address those issues okay. as um, black men? Yeah. Well, it, one of the things that I've been pushing, you know, because I do, a, I actually do a YouTube show called The Onyx Report. One of the things I try to push is, is as simple as it sounds, is black men supporting one another, because we've been, you know, socialized <laughs> in, in this kind of system where we're highly competitive and we, we tend, yes. to, uh, tend to be very individualized. It's very much, you know, uh, like, you know, the OK Corral, we all kind of get out there as lone gunmen trying to fight against this system. I call for black men to work with one another. I call for black yes, men sir. to actually be resources to one another, even in an academic setting. You know, this is something that Dr. Tommy Curry and I have been talking to a lot of people are citing each other. You'd be surprised how few of us will even cite each other's work. Because you know, we're, we're really pushing at this point to build black male studies. 
can we cite one another? Can we publish texts and reference them? I try and interview black male authors as often as possible to get their works out and show solidarity. That's just a low level of it. But, but how do we do that? And can we do it in a variety of different contexts? Because we are not you know, even when it comes to issues that are that are deemed black, we're not often the focus. Like for one of the one of the things I've been telling people, even in the last few months, we saw you know black men who've been victimized and killed in, a, in unprecedented numbers. But when you look to the people they interview, it's often not even black males. You often not even see black males you know forefronted in some of the protests. So we have to actually be able to support one another and put each other on. You know, especially if we have any degree of media access uh, to do that. And I think this event this panel is an excellent example of that but we have to do it more frequently because uh, you know this kind of lone individuals you know kind of thing yeah. is not working for us no thank you okay um I'm, I'm actually gonna throw a question out to the to everyone uh so i know we're here talking about mental health um and i know as we talked about the video primarily spoke about um suicide but can we talk about some other areas uh, that either you have struggled with or that we as a whole don't talk about, uh, whether it is going to see a therapist, whether it's depression um, or, or stress as a whole, that, that we can do a better job of identifying, acknowledging, and then assessing so that we can be better going forward. And I'll open it up to anybody who would like to talk. I, I want to... I wanna... I'm gonna take on that question, but I wanna just go, when well, you said an area that we haven't talked about and where we haven't addressed. And, and it's very problematic for me personally, from what I'm seeing in my practice and in mental health. So the problem with black families is that, and, and, and I wanna also pick it back on what Dr. Rashid said, is not to make the sisters look bad, but systemically and traditionally, going back to welfare, black women have been financially incentivized to be yep. against black men, yep. right? You're gonna get you're gonna get welfare if the black man is not living in the household, right? That's right. Okay, but also you're gonna get more money in the child care and child support, right? If, if if you can show that this father is not involved or keep him not involved, you can get more welfare and child support from this man. So it's always a financial incentive to keep the black man and the woman apart, or from not being you, when when black men and women come to an agreement on shared custody and child support, it's always significantly less than what the court orders. Mm -hmm. right? So black women are being incentivized mm -hmm. to be against the black man. And now I'm, I'm going to put this out here. Okay. Ever since welfare reform. So this is what happened. We chop it. We chop in the financial uh, cash benefit off after five years. Mm -hmm. So they put somebody else in the welfare office and say, Hey, you go take your, your child down to the therapist and have the therapist say your child is crazy, you don't get SSI. Mm -hmm. So now I, I will have five, and a, a black mother coming in with three or four kids saying they all crazy, just say they got this so I can get, so I can wow. get additional housing and SSI. So now these kids are being taught to come and be crazy, right, for, for $600 a month. Now what's the damage of a kid being placed on SSI at seven, eight, nine years old, mm. that ultimately means what, Rashid, you're an, you're an educator. He's gonna be in special ed. He's gonna have an IEP, mm. Yep. right? He, he cannot join the military. You guys know that once that happens, right? He cannot join the military. There's a lot of things he's gonna be excluded from. And every time the systemic person come around, he's gonna to be told to be crazy. So what happens when that kid grow up? Right? I'm, a, I'm crazy, mama. I want my check. So my life now, my ultimate goal now is to get control of this six or $700 a month and not to be uh, uh, maybe a plumber or electrician. College ain't for everybody. My daddy took care of a family of four as a plumber making over $100,000 a year. Right? There's a lot of careers out there that you don't need to have a college education for. But now his sole purpose is to maintain a six or $700 check a month from the state. And ultimately... It is the father's fault for not being involved, but we know the barriers and how the system place the father and the mother against each other. And there's no progress in that. Mm -hmm. That's something that has been killing me to the point where I won't even take it or deal with those cases. 
Well, I can almost tell when they call me, they're calling me specifically on the first session. They come and hand me paperwork for SSI or Social Security. And, and we're not addressing that. Mm -hmm. And it's destroying specifically the vast majority of the kids that I'm seeing are young African-American male children. Yeah, that is such a powerful and profound point. You know, when you bring up social incentivization, incentivization that's, that's incredibly powerful because we can look back the last five or six decades and we can see how this has impacted the black family. Because if you're talking, yeah. talking about a community that historically has lacked wealth and the man of the house can be replaced by an institution that sends a monthly check, what happens after five or six decades? What is the perception of black men even intra-racially even mm -hmm. from other black males who are reared in this system. What, yeah. come, what, how, what happens over generations in terms of the perceptions of black males? Just from that, that's powerful. Okay, so I wanna follow that up with a question that we have in the chat. So of course we acknowledge that there is no one size fits all answer. However, as black women, how can we best support our black men in an informed and sensitive way to engage in a vulnerability and communication when they may not be able to navigate that space comfortably. Sorry. It's what deep. I talked about the mail. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, MFT. Yeah, Dr. Uh, Francis, I would like to hear this also from you. Uh, I would like to, for you to also give us a little bit of uh, religious background as well when you give this answer. It seems like you have a lot of a lot of good information to give. So go ahead. So it, so uh, repeat the question. It, it was about how can just basically in a nutshell, how can the black woman best support uh, the black man? Yes, in an informed oh. and sensitive way to engage in vulnerability and communication when that may not be a space that they navigate comfortably. Okay. The, uh, the Holy Scriptures teach that the, the wife, you know, when a man finds a wife, he finds a good thing. And the wife is the crown of her husband. In other words, she is his bling bling. She is what he puts on to uh, demonstrate um, his, his royalty. And so a good wife is a king maker. Right. She she makes the king. And even when she does not respect the person, she re, she respects his position. So when it, when we walk into a courtroom, we all stand up, not because we like the judge as a person, but we respect the black robes. And so there's something about a woman. Her spirit should rise when he comes into the room because she respects his position, no matter how much he makes a year. She respects him as the husband, the band of the home and the head of the house. Now, there's a lot of sisters that say, well, he may be the head of the home, but I'm the net, so I control him. And, and, and we, we gotta, <laughs> it, it, can't, it can't be that way. Um, she also has to understand, um, and, and brothers made a lot of great points about how, how racism works, right? And she has to, you know, not get caught up in all of these, uh, you know, what they call horizontal issues and get away from, you know, supporting her man as a black man, right? Um, and oftentimes there are various incentives to pull her away from the real agenda. Uh, the, the root of racism, though all other ethnic groups can experience racism, the root of racism is anti-blackness, okay? The root of racism is anti-blackness. And racism is not fluid. It doesn't work for black people one day and work for white people the next day, okay? Racism was a, a social construct uh, constructed for the economic exploitation of African people. And so she has to understand um, how that works and then realize that, as Dr. Claude Anderson once said, that racism is a team sport, right? It's a team sport. And he always says, if you don't play together as a team, you lose by default, right? And, um, uh, you, know, you know, Blacks, we often talk unity, but whites simply just practice it. They practice it, right? And they know how to hand things off. So she has to understand how she is a vital team player in this particular um, in, in this particular life, and and how her job is to go ahead and even though uh, he may experience a lot of economic exploitation, miseducation in schools, how she has to go ahead and continue to stay right by him and not 
like Dr. Hansey says, uh, follow for the banana on the tailpipe, be incentivized uh, by getting rid of that man for a government check, right? And I don't believe this is done by accident. I believe every system uh, produces exactly what it was designed to produce. This is not the system broken. This is the system at work. This system is not accidental. So she has to understand her role in doing so and continuing to stand by his side. I would add to that. Um, often a uh, mother is the first teacher. True. And one of the things that should be taught besides print literacy is systemic literacy and increasing that and cultural sure. literacy Man. so that you are given a purpose. You are basically taught how to get along with others in difficulty and maintain a sense of direction mm -hmm. uh, because part of how this particular system works is not just simply anti-black, it's anti also black woman where mm -hmm. many of our religions were based on a sacred feminine True. Like Christianity was, and many other African religions were based on a sacred feminine. So you had to essentially destroy that connection and that wisdom tradition, that mother wit, right? And so we're lacking often in mother wit, where, hmm. you know, you, what, were you raised with some sense or not? And <laughs> how, do you, how do you negotiate it's those true. particular difficulties and be mm -hmm. able to talk your way out of it. So, you know, it's not simply about being able to talk with a white voice or an ebonic voice or a frank francophone voice or whatever is understanding technical English. So oftentimes, you know, I was uh, faced with, you know, certainly when people come used to come to my office, they weren't expecting Mark Harris to look like me. <laughs> because I speak California news caster English, no accent. And I'm medical. So I'm going to talk scientifically literate because I'm a black medical professional raised by black professionals. I never knew any black criminals. I only knew black professionals that were, you know, one step away from sharecropping and two steps away from slavery. And we were <laughs> the slaves that taught each other how to read when it was a death sentence, that was our identity. Our identity was, look, <laughs> slaves are smart and they wanted to read and they tried to kill us for reading. So that literacy, that print literacy, that systemic literacy, that cultural literacy taught by women and also taught by what we would call gender non-conforming women and basically looking at that side of it and saying, Hmm, the Angela Davises, the Audrey Lords, the James Baldwins, the Langston Hughes, et cetera, et cetera, they contribute to our wisdom traditions as well. So be well read. I just, I, just got, I, I just got to piggyback. You, you got to understand that black men got to start learning to help themselves. And, and I know black women mean well, and they love us to death, and we love them back, but black men got to take accountability for their own health and they gotta if you're gonna have a partner you gotta take listen to your partner man and allow your partner to tell you you gotta go get help go to the yeah. doctor right we gotta we gotta put that ego to the side and listen sometimes yeah and, and also i want to say doc, dr dr Hansen, it's, it's important for the black woman like i said not to get caught up in this institutional cancel culture that's a lot of times supported by white supremacy you, you know what i mean by that is yes we know you know, let's take somebody like an R. Kelly. There's, there's some mental health issues, right? We see the result of it, right? Um, and, and, and I'm not here to try him in any court or anything, but we want to rehabilitate the man so he can probably put out a gospel album, right? We, 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 we want to help the individual. We don't use um, these, these, you know, you know white owned corporations or white supremacy or these channels to come in and hang, literally hang this man. Right. We want to go ahead and assist this man, because at the end of the day, Kelly is still our brother. He's our cousins. He's our uncles. Um, um, he, he belongs to the African family. Right. And so what we want to do is learn 
how to go ahead and assist, like, like Sister Monique said, how do we help this brother? Not just use our platforms, Gil Key, to, to go ahead and, 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 and hang this brother uh, for the pleasure of, you know, of, of white supremacy. Okay. So we have, a, we have a bevy of questions that are flooding in through the, through the question and answer. So we're going to get to those right now. Uh, so the first question, uh, we have identified the manifestations and the causes of poor mental health. The question is, what can we do to improve access and, continue, and continuity of mental health? I actually want to throw this to, to uh, Mr. Cornelia, or Mr. Johnson. Um, with your work with the police uh, for, within your career, can, can you talk about this and, you know, specifically from that perspective? Um, I know that there's a lot of talk around defunding the police and taking some of that money and putting it into other areas. Um, but what would this look like right now if you were to talk about that? How could we improve that access? Oh. Okay. So, so brother, that's an excellent question. I, I think as a, first as a black officer, or should I say an officer who happens to be black, I come with a very unique perspective because I know what it is to be in those communities on the other end of a baton, mm -hmm. whooping my butt. And so what the first step we have to do as African-American officers is reconnect ourselves to that community. We, I, for instance, we started a program, it's called the fishing program. And you guys all know the proverb, you teach a man how to give a man fish he eats for a day and he's my fish he eats for a lifetime. We, we worked with our young brothers and really training them and getting them reconnected to the community by learning skills. A simple skill as writing a resume was very pertinent in terms of that development. Going out there and learning how to uh, apply yourself or apply for applications, now it's, it's, it's changing. So all these life skills, we can do that. We have to put the boots back on the ground and get to the problems in the community by being present by going out to these, these, these programs, our community centers, where people come to look for answers. Going back to the black church, Dr. Francis talked about that, and being part of that. We have to begin to take out the uniform and roll up our sleeves and put these jeans on and have these conversations. So it's not just doing one thing from a law enforcement point, point of view. So let me just, one quick thing. We, the, the official title of a police officer is a peace officer. Our job is to maintain the peace. Our job is to create environments where people come and thrive, where our young kids can play on the street without worrying about being shot by a bullet. Our young daughters can go out there without worrying about being molested. Our young men can go out there and worry about not getting shot by the police. That is a safe haven. And the mental health aspect of it, if I don't feel safe in my, in my environment, all this other stuff we're talking about, becomes a moot point. So the first thing we have to start to look at is the, the really the health of that individual in that community and start connecting them on being part of it and working on that development of becoming a boy to man. And I think Dr. Hansey said it earlier, we got to take responsibility as black men to be present in, our, in, in the lives of our daughters, in our, in our son's lives, uh, even though we're not with the, 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 the mother, you know, how do we begin to do that? So from a law enforcement point of view, that's the first thing we had we, that I promoted in trying to use community policing, the philosophy, in getting people to be a part of their problems by solving their own problems. I would tell you right now, if anyone looking to government to solve these black problems, you're looking in the wrong place. If you're looking to to, to, to other entities, you're looking to the wrong place. If we are going to solve these problems in terms of police relations, it starts with us. We have to be able to demand from the system that how we want to be policed, number one, but we also got to be responsible in terms of that our conduct is being a beyond reproach. So I would say that, you know, from, from my point of view, is getting back there and just working with brothers in your schools. The highest dropout rate was young black men. 30 seconds, brother. The, the highest disciplinary rate. So as a police officer, seeing that, you go back in there and create a classroom with these young brothers. Don't send them home. Send them to me. So, so, <laughs> so it, 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 it's, a, it's a lot to it. But I would only close by saying that, you know, it's our duty. I don't care if you're a doctor, janitor, 
are priests. It's our okay. responsibility. Mr. Moore, can 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 you ask that same question to uh, Dr. Rashid? I I was you 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 just took it out of my mind. I was gonna say <laughs> Rashid been real quiet, brother Rashid. Uh, can you talk about that again? I will read it for you. Uh, we have already identified the manifestations and the cause of poor mental health. So how do we improve access and the continuity of mental health? Access. That's that's the key question. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's there's a lot of gatekeeping. I mean, Dr. Hansi, I'm pretty sure, could allude to that. I mean, um, Dr. Hassan, we know, I mean, plenty of us know on, on this call that oftentimes we are thwarted from even having access. I mean, the fact that, you know, Black males make up 2% of the educators. I mean, so that's the million dollar question. And so if we are having a dip, if we're having difficulties and challenges in the ways in which to have access, and this goes back to Dr. Francis, we have to create our own infrastructure. Mm -hmm. We have to create our own infrastructure where we're unapologetic. We're All not praises. asking people for access. We mm -hmm. have it. I mean, look on this call right now. Look at all these scholars. I mean, all these, you know, a multiplicity of thought leaders that we have on here. It's not like we can't do it, but oftentimes we're not allowed to do it. So we just need to make sure we do it. Like Nike, and I'm not promoting Nike, but I'm just saying we have to do it unapologetically. And I know we work in different spheres and spaces and everything where they kind of, you know, want to limit what we say and center, especially black males in particular. But we have to go about that. And again, this goes with Dr. T. Uh, Hassan Johnson said, we have to make sure we're advocating for each other. So how mm -hmm. does that work look as far as accessing? We're doing it right now. This can't be a one-off. You know, my brother T. Hassan, he has a show. You know what I mean? My brother, Dr. Um, my uh, Francis is about to have a black newspaper. I mean, we have different people who are doing different things that we have to support. That begins to uh, provide the access. My brother, Dr. Hansi, is working on the second PhD. You know, my Jigna and Griot, Professor Harris, has been a beacon within, you know, the UG community for several years, a wealth of knowledge. We need to tap into that. There's access there. A lot, oftentimes, we want to follow what, you know, popular culture is telling us to follow. Mm -hmm. We need to get that access from them instead of reaching from the, you know, within and what we have already there. So really, the, the question is kind of, the answer is kind of simple to me. I mean, it's not simple to do because some of the confines that are placed on us, and we have to break those shackles that are placed on us, and oftentimes we place on our own selves, but we just have to do it. We just have to do it. And okay. again, to me, it's obligatory for us to do it. We have an obligation to those young brothers and sisters to make sure that access is provided for them. 30 seconds. Not, the cycle will continue. Thank you. Okay. All right, so I have another question that's on the floor. I'm gonna actually direct this to uh, Dr. Hassan and to Mr. Pitts. Uh, so the question is, how do we build the infrastructure that is needed for black men to feel valued and promoted, not only from others, but in cult, but within our own culture? Uh, so Brother Pitts, can you talk about that from a collegiate experience uh, seeing that you are an advisor here at the university or at University of Oregon, uh, and then and then for Dr. Hassan, I'd like for you to kind of speak about that on a larger scale. Um, I think the first thing is to one realize that uh, you know you, you have to look at the cultural geography of the place, and and you know there are things that black men are going through in Oregon that they wouldn't go through have they went through in Memphis. Like there'd be different worries in Memphis uh, where the cops might not be the biggest problem. It might be that black dude wearing a certain color. Uh, <clears throat> so I'll speak specifically about here. Uh, I mean, and I've said this before, I, I think that we baby some of these uh, black students period because we, a lot of them are in this phase where if you if you step to them straight, you know you treat them like a man or a woman. They be like, "Oh, I'm fool with him," or there's that delayed realization that, "Oh yeah, this dude was on was on me hard, but it's because he actually cared and he saw more than me." But we often are countered by some of our white counterparts 
who some of these black students actually see as more valid than us, even though we're the ones that are there for them all the time. You know, there have been s s different situations where various students of, uh, who were not white, you know, I had to pop off on somewhat politely and as opposed to like embracing it and realizing like this dude actually knows what he's talking about, they ran to my white boss and told on me or my words weren't valid enough. And we see this going on and we don't check these students. Like, look, uh, it, it, I think that there's one thing to be supportive and to understand mental health, but I think that we are allowing these students to operate at a deficit because we aren't pushing them to get that internship. You know, like I said, I used to be a career coach too. So when I think academics, I think career together and you cannot separate the two. And so push them to go to career service, push them to go to the event. And then when they say, oh, I'm good, I ain't go, you ask why, but then you turn around and say, hey, look, you know, if you want to succeed, you're going to have to step outside your box. You chose to come to the University of Oregon and we're going to make it as good as possible for you. But guess what? You or your parents ain't paying out this money for you to sit around and be complacent. Like you are descendants of kings and queens, act like it. And I digress. Brother Johnson. <laughs> okay. Um, can you give me the question one more time? Of course I can. Uh, let me go. Let me, let me go back. So, oh, did I press it already? Okay, hold on. Here we go. So, how do we build the infrastructure that is needed for Black men to feel valued and promoted, not only from others, but in our own culture? Okay, I think the two things that come to mind for that is again coming to grips with the reality of the barriers and looking at them from an institutional lens. And then the other thing has to do with what I would call institutional infighting. So starting with the first one, I teach in the CSU system. The California State University system is the largest system in the country, mm -hmm. right? In the first year, right, 70% of black males drop out. Mm -hmm. If I make this just about, you know, whether or not they, they have the wherewithal individually to handle this, I'm not going to be able to solve the problem because this is a larger issue than that. We're talking about black males that are going to, you know, a number of different campuses. They're coming out of a variety. They're not all from the hood. You know, they're coming from all kinds of different backgrounds. There is still, however, a consistent factor that implement, that impacts whether or not they're able to endure their first year, right? Many of them are still first generation college students. Many of them have not had a K through 12 experience that has actually prepped them for college. And it's right. to an unprecedented degree. Now, here's the irony. We also have a problem with labeling things as black issues, strictly on a racial basis. But if black women in the last few years have been recently designate, designated the group most enrolled in, in higher education and black males, you know, in the largest you know, university system in the country are dropping out by 70 percent in their first year. There's clearly an issue that we're not talking about. And race alone is not going to satisfy the discussion. And this is why I advocate for black male studies. Because in contemporary America and mainstream culture, when we talk about the black community, we talk about it as this amalgamated racial unit. But there are a variety of different experiences that happen across gender, across class, that aren't always teased out. And often for the sake of solidarity, we don't get to it. So we got to be able to talk about black males honestly, unapologetically, and it shouldn't matter whose feelings it hurts as long as we get to the issue. Now, the infighting part of it that I was talking about has to do with institutional resources, whether public, private, philanthropic. What we're seeing is this constant competition for resources. Now, I can take you back to Obama starting the program for black males, uh, black and Latino males, right? My brother's keeper. I can talk about it in terms of, of the recent exploits going on in terms of activism and BLM. What we're seeing happening is there's been moments where black males have been designated to suffer from certain maladies to greater extent than other demographics, but immediately what takes place is a competition over who should get those resources. I have seen this happen nationally. I've also seen it happen at my very campus. The moment where black males seconds. become the, the, the point of the discussion is the very moment where people start to compete and argue about why, and they're usually not using any data, it's usually a lot of shaming, but why black males shouldn't be the focus, right? And what ends up happening is black males at the end of the discussion, and I can go into more depth, but I don't have time, but at the end of the discussion, black males end up actually doing worse Say when it. the conversation ends. 
because we haven't actually developed any mechanism that helps them. We've just had a lot of infighting about why they shouldn't get the help. Exactly. Yeah, that was great. Western Olympics. Okay. Western Olympics. I, uh, I want to make sure that we get a chance to get to the rest of the questions. We have about three more questions and about 10 more minutes left. So I'm going to ask brothers to, if you can, could concise your answer to two minutes. So that way, if I have somebody want to chime in additionally, that we can go ahead and address that. So the next I question. I believe I have a two minute answer to this. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so basically we need to create uh, institutions outside of the mainstream institutions. So mm -hmm. I've been here for 36 years. Um, so the attempt to work through the system that has been resistant, uh, we basically created a rites of passage program uh, to independently socialize and educate our youth because the school systems were failing, the university was failing, and uh, you know we needed to talk about, if you were talking about uh, black male role models, okay, well, Paul Robeson came to Eugene, the, I've referenced Dr. Bell, you know, Derek Bell, who taught at the University of Oregon and left. So when we're talking about black male health, you know, there's also you know, therapists, practitioners that left the University of Oregon uh, because of the hostile racial climate, which still continues to this day. So how do you survive by essentially creating institutions outside and independent of the mainstream institutions while also simultaneously uh, creating a, a more less hostile work environment within those institutions. You have to do both simultaneously. Got it. Mr. Moore, I just want to ask uh, Dr. Johnson a question. Does that 70% also uh, represent HBCUs too? No, no, no. We're talking strictly within the Cal State system in okay. California. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. And so, Doc, Dr. Hansey, this question is going to be for you. But I'm sorry. Uh, I, I'm sorry. But I will say I do have data on HBCUs and black males are actually beneath both non-black students and black women. So we can have that conversation, too. I will allow you to plug all of your uh, social media and everything at the end of the at the end. So I want to make sure you, we get to that. All right. So, Dr. Hansey, what are the strategies black men can use to offset some of the challenges and abuses of the system spoken of thus far? and what bridges with their female counterparts can be built to improve quality of life for black young men in female led homes. You like that one, I see. All right, that's a mouthful, man. Are you giving me two minutes? You see that? Uh, yeah, you two see minutes. that? <laughs> that's a, listen, your Go question took a minute 30 seconds. <laughs> I did. I didn't write it. I just want you to know that. But you. But you are cutting. You are cutting into your time. First, first, first and foremost, right? I'm gonna go back. I'm, I gotta fall back on Dr. Johnson, man. Look, the the issues are so systemic. Just like I said, going back from childhood, where we have our young black males being put on SSI, and these kids are getting. And I'm. Gonna, I'm gonna go with Dr. Uh, Mr. Pitt said, right? The, the biggest issue, and I'm going to say it, the biggest issue to the black man is white sympathizers, okay? Mm. This, <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, he had a rough childhood. Say it, Hamzy. Oh, my God. Let's, let's give this young black man. I'm going to pass him through the fifth grade because his daddy hasn't been in crack. Oh, right? And then when they get to Dr. Johnson, they, they can barely write an essay. They can barely comprehend, right? So... The infrastructure is this. I don't, I don't care if you're in a single father household, a single mother household. You have to advocate and fight for your children's education. You cannot take any sympathy. If your child needs to be held back, hold him back, right? We cannot afford to let any more of our kids get to the point to where they're graduating with zero high school uh, units. Like how you graduate when you didn't complete one class in high school, and then you're going to tell this kid he can go to Cal State, whatever, and be successful. It's not, you're setting them up for failure. So, and it's, the other thing is this, I, again, I love females willing to help and I get the woman want to be supported, right? I love that about black women. They will never give up on black men, but eventually you have to fight for yourself. Every, every man here 
that's on this thing made it at some point in their life decided like I want to be better, I want to do more, and they and they put it inside of themselves that they will be better, they will do more, and they seconds. did, right? So it, it, I get the love and appreciation, but get out of the build a man stage, right? Black men are not build a bears, okay? You cannot build this man into something. He is what he is, is where he at. And the problem has been systemic since birth. You cannot fix that, okay? But you can't focus on your children. And I get it. You want to help because there's a lack of quality black men out there. But to take someone, you cannot make him your project. And, and, and what's happening is you're making these, these broken black men your project and you're creating a broken black man in your son. And it's Got perpetuating it. the cycle. So put your energy where it's good use. All right. I'm going to take one more question. Uh, we have two more. So I'm going to try to go ahead and get both of these in before we end up with the night. All right. So is the Black Lives Movement overtly demasculating the black male? If so, why? Anybody is open for that? Ooh, just <laughs> I, I, let, can I just say this? And I, I'm going to try to do it in a, in a minute. Um, and so you, you talk about uh, Black Lives Matter, right? I, I'll, I'll say this. One, you have to know how it's funded. Everything that has a black face is not black funded. The hand that pays is the hand that sways. You have to understand that. And a lot of our movements have been co-opted for white profit. Okay. If you look at the NBA, the greatest sale in Jersey, they have out right now has equality and racism. You have all of these vague terms. Okay. What is equality? How do you achieve it? How, what is freedom? How do you achieve it? Black lives matter. How do we actually make black lives matter? And so what's happening is white supremacy has co-opted the movement taking control a lot of our movements and then what you see is black people at the end of the day all we get is listening and learning but we get no reparations we have no economic development so so we have to go ahead and and, and really look at these institutions that have uh, a black face but are funded by white people because as we all know and as all, all black men we've worked in public education or higher education it's hard to fight white supremacy when you're being funded by white supremacy there it is all right, I appreciate I, that. I, I would chime, can I chime in real quick? Go for it, bro. go and, for it, sir. A minute, all, go for it. I'm going to. I, I'm a full supporter of Black Lives Matter because the simple fact that we have to understand what was the impetus and gave it birth. That started yes. back in 2014 when Michael yes. Brown was shot, and by Daryl Daryl. I think his name was Daryl Wilson, the officer, and then that that started the whole conversation that gives value to black lives. That's going the same with the civil rights movement. Black Lives Matter was born out of the idea of two things. One, addressing police brutality and systemic racism. How and they get funded, that's something that has always been the case with these black organizations. But I would have, we have to give them credit because we're talking about these issues now. You have a movement in place of trying to re-evaluate police delivery of services in the black community. That's because back Black Lives Matter started the conversation. You have a campaign zero talking about how do we have police reform? How do we stop police violence against black 30 seconds. bodies? That's because Black Lives Matter. So let's not forget how we got here. We can always find ways to improve something, but we can't, we can't take away the legs that which got us here in the first place. So I, how do we make it better? Can I, can I add to that, please? I'll give you a minute, go for it. Thank you. I want us to be very clear too, and with all due respect, Brother, Brother Johnson, there were two Black Lives Matters. I think we yes. need to understand that. There was the larger response and then there was the formal organization. And many of us didn't even know it was a formal organization. Back in 2015, when, when, when Michael Brown died, we all were cheering, hands up, don't shoot. And when the chant True. changed to Black Lives Matter, we all were like, all right, I mean, next evolution of the chant, it didn't matter. We didn't know it was a formal organization. And by the time we found out, there was a lot we didn't know about it. We, this, you know, this was also an organization that was actually telling black men, you can join, but you can't have any significant leadership position. They're not yeah. outlined on the website at all as having any significant standing in the family. Our deaths were used for the advancement of a particular agenda, but the actual presence of black men was fairly unwelcome. So you have a larger movement of people who are organically and grassroots nationwide and worldwide to some extent moving toward this particular idea, but then you had a formal organization that was actually removing and downplaying the voices of living black men. 
And when they did talk about dead black men, they talked about them in terms of how to advance the organization's profile. So what I'm saying to you is, yes, Black Lives Matter as, as a movement did a lot to bring these questions to bear, but in it, we're talking about a degree of misandry that people are not really ready to deal with yet. Oh, Jesus. We so appreciate it. I, pre- I, 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 I want to make sure that we move on. I'll get our last question in. I want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to plug themselves. All right, so the last question is uh, the notion of rehabilita- uh, rehabilitating a man who has been publicly hypersexualized and incentivized to engage in that hypersexuality as black men usually are. Can one of you speak to how society has perpetuated that identity onto black men and how we can begin to shift the narrative, allowing black men to explore sexuality more organically and specifically as young men in a way that promotes mental health? I'm going to give my minute, two minutes to Dr. Hassan because he's done a lot of research on this um, specifically. Okay. About can, that. can you take this? Take us home. Take us home, Dr. Hassan, please. Home. Well, I was reading the question again, but it disappeared from the screen. So no. I think the question had to do with, with how is this identity imposed on Black men? Uh, yes. You want me to read it one more time for you? Please, one more time. All right. The notion of rehabilitating... Re, I cannot speak tonight. Rehabilitating? There you go. Rehabilitating a man who has been publicly hypersexualized and incentivized to engage in that hypersexuality, as many black men are. Can you speak to how society has perpetuated that identity onto black men and how we can begin to shift the narrative, allowing black men to explore sexuality more organically and specifically as young men in a way that promotes mental health? And that is a powerful question. And I'm gonna answer it in a way that still you know, allows my brothers on this panel to participate, because that is huge. One of the biggest ways we do have to look at this through this, look at this is through corporatization. Whether we're talking about hip hop, whether we're talking about film, Mm. television, or academic theory, all of these ideas about black men have been filtered through institutions we don't control. They're white supremacists in their orientation, and they are actually well invested in undermining black men. And to the degree that black men are socialized into ideas that are alien to us, again, go back to Tommy Curry's Man Not. If you're not reading that book and looking at the impact of 19th century white ethnology on black masculinity, on the imposition of these ideas that are alien to black men, if we're not looking at that, then we'll buy into the idea that these ideas are inherently true and treat black men thusly. That's not the issue. So we have to first study, we have to understand where these ideas come from, and then we got to look at the corporate structures that impose them. So in hip hop, you had key artists that were hired and put on because of yep. what they talked about, and you had other artists that were silenced. When it came to film and television, when it came to writers and producers and directors who wanted to make yep. independent black films, those films did not get major backing. They were put into the side and you had to see them on your computer if you were lucky. The ideas have been regulated. And, and so we've, it's, been such, it's been going on for so long that we actually take it as truth that these ideas yep. about hypermasculinity actually do reflect black masculinity and those are not the same thing. But please Absolutely. participate, brothers. Word. Okay, 30 uh, seconds, go for it. Who, who else would like to chime in? Let me let me just uh, just just to echo um, what he what he said. I think he said it um, perfectly. When you you talk about a Cosby, you talk about a Kelly and stuff like that. Um, you know, hip hop. Um, you know, this the sexualized R and B. These are uh, a, a lot of these because the institution is white owned and white funded, right? A, a lot of hip hop artists have become living minstrel shows, right? That we believe is real. Right. And has been projected onto our community. And then we think this is black culture. And if you talk to the, the regular person on the streets, they think BET is black culture when BET is not black owned. Right. And so they show the worst of us. They show these reality show that 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 that, that says violence is love. And and because blacks tend to watch more television than any other ethnic group, the reason why they call it television programming, because it's programming our minds to worship. Uh, Eurocentric materialism as a god to hate each other, to not to trust one another, and we have bought in to this myth, right? That goes seconds. all the way back uh, to to birth of a nation and and how it portrayed uh, black men in the media. So, anyway, well, that, and, and, and absolutely, 
And that's so deep seated, we no longer have an idea of how to be compassionate. Brother, you raised the whole issue of R. Kelly, which is a can of worms. I think when you said it, everybody said, <laughs> oh, Jay. But let's you be talk real. About we know how to criminalize him, but the man that's was right. raped by his sister, and so was his brother, and exactly. violated by a man in the community when he was young. We know how to penalize him. We have no idea how to actually contextualize his experiences and make sense of it. That speaks to how black men are seen overall. And they will use black R women Kelly to lynch him. But they Brother, use black women say, to lynch him. Dr. Dr. Harris, I want to make sure I get to you. Uh, I, I heard you to speak up, so go ahead. Or prevent R. Kelly's from happening. Yes, sir. That's right. Um, yes, just tell me real quick, AD, AP, I know you got to go. We got to go. We up against uh, the we, we are. The next tackling taboo, we already hit on it. We're talking about R. Kelly. I did this before, <laughs> but we have to talk about molestation in the Black community. In particular, how it impacts Black males is something that's very taboo. We will revisit this conversation. Definitely want to get a shout out to Griot, Greatness Rediscovered in Our Time. All you brothers, AP, take us home, brother. You did a wonderful job. Bless you. I, I will. I, I, see, I, I, I know we're about to end. Yes, sir. I just got to get this off my chest. 30 seconds. <laughs> I got 30 you. Seconds. 30, se 30 seconds. Listen, we go need for to it. Put our, Lamont said it best. Lamont said it best. Dr. Francis said it best. Listen, whenever there's a black movement since civil rights for anything, right, capitalism comes in, swoops it up, and controls the message, right? They learn from civil rights. If we don't control the message, right? We don't control right. the outcome. And right. whenever there's a black movement that's backed by white capitalism, it's mm. yep. Oh, 10 seconds, 10 uh, seconds. I got, <laughs> this is, I'm about to say, I got to make sure. Gotta, 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 this is I'm why, you, this is why you have a George Floyd. See, when you have these movements like Black Lives Matter, they love to deify black men in death, but devalue us in life. So you sure. would have hated that man and clutched your purse if you saw George Floyd coming in life, but mm. then he's deified in death. Mm. And they do that to King, they've done that to Malcolm X, they do that to all men. So if you can sit there and celebrate and, and do marches and put t-shirts on for a black man who is dead, what will you do for the black men who are living? We're alive, do something for us. I appreciate That's what I all right, that was great to that, you know what that's that is that was a powerful way to Woo, doctor. Uh and so in closing, um one I want to thank all the panelists, uh the moderator, uh for all of the you know, this was hard work tonight to come on and, and talk about these things. Um but specifically I would like to acknowledge Lane Community Colleges, Concepcion Cani Mesquita Multicultural Center the Office of Equity and Inclusion, the Black Student Union, mm -hmm. the Academic Technology Center, the Department of Academic Technology, the Associated Students of Lane Community College, the Lane Community College Administration, Lane African American Black Student Success Program, the University of Oregon, the Eugene Springfield uh, NAACP, Blacks in Government, and, and GRIOT, again, the Greatness Rediscovered in Our Times Mentoring Program. Um, uh, everyone that was on here tonight, if you don't have their information, although Brother Rashid's going to get mad, I'm going to give y'all brothers, everybody, I'm going to just call you out, give your information, whether it be social, email, for people to contact you, and then we're going to close this thing out. Brother Rashid. Uh, you, you can reach me at power underscore 1906, Riyadh Mentoring on Facebook, you know, holla at your boy. Dr. Hassan Johnson. You can find me at thassanjohnson.com. You can also find me, if you look up Dr. T. Hassan Johnson, find my YouTube channel and find the Onyx Report. Dr. Richard Hansey. Uh, it's uh, Dr. Richard Hansey at gmail.com and just put my name in, in on uh, Yahoo and everything will pop up. For, oh, no, I'm sorry, excuse me, Facebook. Just put my name in Facebook, you'll see my, my pages pop up. Dr. Francis. Yeah, you can go ahead um, and, and, and catch me on www.deltabayclc.org. That's the church website. Or you can contact me and through email, lfran512 at aol.com. And you can also catch me on Facebook, uh, Dr. Lamont Ali Francis. Mr. Pitts. Uh, yeah, you can catch me at dpitts. That's D-P-I-T-T-S at uorgan.edu. If you're on campus, just ask for the black dude that has good candy, and they'll know it's me. 
<laughs> Mr. Johnson. You can contact me at conjohnson1 gmail.com. Thank you. And last but not least, the griot himself, Dr. Harris. www.gurumukmarkharris.com, maroon grio at gmail. Whoa. And if anyone would like to contact me, AP Moore at uorgan.edu. Uh, again, I want to thank all you brothers for everything you did tonight. And if you enjoy, please follow us for the next one. AP, I got to give a shout out to Deontay Carter, Tracy Weimer, you know, Randy Pay uh, Painter, um, Terry Holloway, the people behind the scenes um, to make all, make all this come together. Got to give a shout out to all them. We couldn't have been done without them. They've been great. We Thank over time, you. four minutes, but they've been rock stars. So really want to shout out them. And I just want to shout out you brothers again for taking up your time. I know the NBA is back, so we're about to watch the Clippers and the Lakers, right, so we get all this. So I'll right, holler at y'all. Hey, Dr. Harris, you have a book? I'm in, in the process of publishing. Oh. Contact me. Good. Again, thank you, you to publisher? our IT team. Thank you all for coming out tonight, and we'll see you at the next one. Have a good night. Mm -hmm.